Dracula by Bram Stoker. Read by Robert Powell. May the 3rd, Bistritz. This journal which I'm keeping, in shorthand, is a record of how I, Jonathan Harker, undertook my first important commission since I qualified as a lawyer. I'm travelling to Transylvania on behalf of a client of our firm, one Count Dracula. It was on the dark side of twilight when we got to Bistritz, which is a very interesting old place. Count Dracula had directed me to go to the Golden Krona Hotel. I was evidently expected, for when I got near the door I faced a cheery-looking elderly woman in the usual peasant dress. She bowed and said, The Herr Englishman? Yes, I said, Jonathan Harker. She smiled and gave me a letter. My friend, welcome to the Carpathians. I am anxiously expecting you. At three tomorrow the coach will start for Bukovina. At the Borgo Pass my carriage will await you and will bring you to me. I trust that you will enjoy your stay in my beautiful land. Your friend, Dracula. Fourth of May. I found that my landlord had got a letter from the Count, directing him to secure the best place on the coach for me. Just before I was leaving, the old lady came up to my room and said in a very hysterical way, Must you go? Oh, young hare, must you go? It is the eve of St. George's Day. Do you not know that tonight, when the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world will have full sway? Do you know where you are going and what you are going to? Finally she went down on her knees and implored me not to go. It was all very ridiculous, but I did not feel comfortable. She saw, I suppose, the doubt in my face, for she put her rosary and crucifix around my neck and said, For your mother's sake! and went out of the room. I am not feeling nearly as easy in my mind as usual. 5th of May, 3 p.m. When we started, the crowd round the inn door all made the sign of the cross and pointed two fingers towards me. I got a fellow passenger to tell me what they meant. He explained that it was a charm or guard against the evil eye. Then our driver cracked his big whip over his four small horses, which ran abreast, and we set off on our journey. As we wound our endless way, the shadows of the evening began to creep round us. By the roadside were many crosses, and as we swept by, my companions all crossed themselves. As we flew along, the driver leaned forward, and on each side the passengers peered eagerly into the darkness. At last we saw before us the Borgo Pass opening out on the eastern side. There were dark, rolling clouds overhead, and in the air the heavy, oppressive sense of thunder. I was now myself looking out for the conveyance which was to take me to the Count. Each moment I expected to see the glare of lamps through the blackness, but all was dark. There was no sign of a vehicle. I was already thinking what I had best do when the driver said, There is no carriage here. The hare is not expected after all. He will now come on to Bukovina. Whilst he was speaking, the horses began to neigh and snort and plunge wildly. Then, amongst a chorus of screams from the peasants and a universal crossing of themselves, a carriage with four horses overtook us and drew up beside the coach. They were driven by a tall man, with a long brown beard and a great black hat, which seemed to hide his face from us. I could only see the gleam of a pair of very bright eyes which seemed red in the lamplight. He said to the driver, you are early tonight, my friend. The Herr English was in a hurry. That is why, I suppose, you wished him to go on to Bukovina. You cannot deceive me, my friend. As he spoke, he smiled. The lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth, as white as ivory. Give me the luggage. With exceeding alacrity, my bags were handed out and put in the carriage. Then I descended, the driver helping me with a hand which caught my arm in a grip of steel. Without a word he shook his reins, the horses turned, and we swept into the darkness of the pass. By and by I struck a match and looked at my watch. It was within a few minutes of midnight. 
Then a dog began to howl somewhere in a farmhouse far down the road, a long, agonized wailing as if from fear. The sound was taken up by another dog, and then another, and another, till a wild howling began which seemed to come from all over the country. Then, far off in the distance, from the mountains, began a louder and sharper howling, that of wolves, which affected both the horses and myself in the same way, for I was minded to jump from the carriage and run, whilst they reared again and plunged madly, so that the driver had to use all his great strength to keep them from bolting. The howling of the dogs grew fainter as we went on our way. The baying of the wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though they were closing round on us from every side. Suddenly, I became conscious of the fact that the driver was pulling up the horses in the courtyard of a vast, ruined castle. Several dark ways led from it under great round arches. The driver jumped down and held out his hand to assist me to alight. His hand seemed like a steel vice that could have crushed mine if he'd chosen. Then he took out my trunks and placed them on the ground close to a great door, old and studded with large iron nails. The driver jumped again into his seat and shook the reins. The horses started forward and disappeared down one of the dark openings. I stood in silence where I was, for I did not know what to do. Of bell or knocker there was no sign. All I could do now was to be patient and to wait the coming of the morning. Just as I had come to this conclusion, there was a sound of rattling chains and the clanking of massive bolts drawn, and the great door swung open. Within stood a tall, old man, clean-shaven save for a long white moustache, and clad in black from head to foot. Welcome to my house. Enter freely and of your own will. I am Dracula. And I bid you welcome, Mr. Harker, to my house. Come in. The night air is chill, and you must need to eat and rest. He insisted on carrying my bags up a winding stair, and along a great passage on whose stone floor our steps rang heavily. At the end of this I rejoiced to see a well-lit room in which a table was spread for supper, and on whose mighty hearth a great fire of logs flamed and flared. The Count halted, put down my bags, and said, I pray you, be seated and sup how you please. You will, I trust, excuse me that I do not join you, but I have dined already. During the time that I was eating, I had an opportunity of observing him. His face was strong, with high bridge of the thin nose and peculiarly arched nostrils. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy moustache, was fixed and rather cruel-looking, with peculiarly sharp white teeth. These protruded over the lips, whose ruddiness showed astonishing vitality in a man of his years. As I looked towards the window, I saw the first dim streak of the coming dawn. I heard, as if from down below in the valley, the howling of wolves. The Count's eyes gleamed, and he said, Listen to them. The children of the night, what music they make. Then, seeing my expression, You dwellers in the city cannot enter into the feelings of the hunter. Then he rose and said, But you must be tired. Your bedroom is all ready, and tomorrow I have to be away till the afternoon. So sleep well, and dream well. 7th of May. I slept till late in the day. I went into the room where we had supped, and found a cold breakfast laid out. When I had done, I looked for the bell, so that I might let the servants know I had finished, but I could not find one. There are certainly odd deficiencies in the house. I opened a door in the room, and found a sort of library, containing, to my great delight, a vast number of English books. A table in the centre was littered with English magazines and newspapers, though none of them were of very recent date. Whilst I was looking at the books, the door opened, and the Count entered. I am glad you found your way in here, for I am sure there is much that will interest you. These books have been good friends to me ever since I had the idea of going to London. 
I long to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London. But alas, as yet I only know your tongue through books. You shall, I trust, rest here with me a while, so that by our talking I may learn the English intonation. You may go anywhere you wish in this castle, except where the doors are locked, where, of course, you will not wish to go. Come, tell me of London, and of the house which you have procured for me. With him I went into the plans and deeds and figures of all sorts. When I had got his signature to the necessary papers, and had written a letter to Mr. Hawkins, the head of my firm, I read to him the notes which I had made. The estate is called Carfax. The house is very large, and of all periods back to medieval times, for one part is of stone immensely thick, with only a few windows high up, and heavily barred with iron and is close to an old chapel or church. There are but few houses close at hand, one being a very large house recently formed into a private lunatic asylum. It is not, however, visible from the grounds. When I had finished, he said, I rejoice that there is a chapel of old times. We Transylvanian nobles love not to think that our bones may be amongst the common dead. He left me and I began to look at some of the books. One was an atlas, which I found opened naturally at England. I found certain places marked, and on examining these I noticed that one was near to London, where his new estate was situated. The other two were Exeter and Whitby, on the Yorkshire coast. 8th of May I had hung my shaving glass by the window, and was just beginning to shave. Suddenly I heard the Count's voice saying to me, "'Good morning.' I started, for it amazed me that I had not seen him, since the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. In starting I cut myself slightly. I turned to the glass again, and this time there could be no error. There was no reflection of him in the mirror. At that instant I saw that the cut had bled a little and the blood was trickling over my chin. When the Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with a sort of demoniac fury, and he suddenly made a grab at my throat. I drew away, and his hand touched the crucifix. It made an instant change in him. Take care, he said. Take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think. After breakfast, I did a little exploring of the castle. I went out on the stairs and found a room looking towards the south. The view was magnificent. The castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. When I had seen the view, I explored further. Doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all locked and bolted. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. When I found that I was a prisoner in Dracula's castle, a sort of wild feeling came over me. Of one thing only am I certain. It is no use making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned. He has done it himself. 12th of May. Last evening the Count began asking me questions on legal matters and on the doing of certain kinds of business. Write now, my young friend, to your employer, Mr. Peter Hawkins, and to any other, he said, and say, if it will please you, that you shall stay with me until a month from now. Do you wish me to stay so long? I asked. I desire it much. I will take no refusal. What could I do but bow acceptance? It was Mr. Hawkins' interest, not mine. Besides, I was a prisoner and if I wished it, could have no choice. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discourse of things other than business in your letters. I determined to write only formal notes now, but to write fully to Mr. Hawkins in secret, and also to Mina, for to her I could write in shorthand, which would puzzle the Count if he did see it. When I had written my two letters, I sat quiet reading a book, 
whilst the Count wrote several notes. Then he took up my two, placed them with his own, and put by his writing materials. At the door he turned and said, Let me warn you, that should you leave these rooms you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. I shall not fear to sleep in any place where he is not. When he left me I went to my room. I looked out over the beautiful expanse. As I leaned from the window, my eye was caught by something moving a story below me, where I imagined that the windows of the Count's own room would look out. What I saw was the Count's head coming out from the window. I saw the whole man slowly emerge and begin to crawl down the castle wall over the dreadful abyss, face down with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. I am in fear, in awful fear, and there is no escape for me. 15th May Once more have I seen the Count go out in his lizard fashion, and thought to use the opportunity to explore. I went back to the room, and taking a lamp, tried all the doors. They were all locked as I had expected. At last, however, I found one door at the top of a stairway which gave a little under pressure. This was evidently the portion of the castle occupied in bygone days, for the furniture had more air of comfort than any I had seen. The yellow moonlight softened the wealth of dust which lay over all. Here I am, sitting at a little oak table, writing in my diary in shorthand all that has happened since I closed it last. Later, the morning of 16th May. God preserve my sanity. I suppose I must have fallen asleep. I hope so. But all that followed was startlingly real. I was not alone. In the moonlight opposite me were three young women. Though the light was behind them, they threw no shadow on the floor. Two were dark and had great piercing eyes that seemed to be almost red. The other was fair, as fair as can be, with golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires. All three had brilliant white teeth. One said, He is young and strong. There are kisses for us all. The fair girl went on her knees and bent over me. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of the lips on the super-sensitive skin of my throat and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. But at that instant I was conscious of the presence of the Count. I saw his strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman and with giant's power draw it back. How dare you touch him, any of you? Back, I tell you all, this man belongs to me. Are we to have nothing tonight? said one of them with a low laugh as she pointed to the bag which he had thrown upon the floor, and which moved as though there were some living thing within it. There was a gasp and a low wail as of a half-smothered child. The women closed round, but as I looked they disappeared, and with them the dreadful bag, and I sank down unconscious. I awoke in my own bed. If it was the Count that carried me here and undressed me, he must have been hurried in his task, for my pockets are intact. I am sure this diary would have been a mystery to him which he would not have brooked. He would have taken or destroyed it. 19th May Last night the Count asked me to write three letters, one saying that my work here was nearly done and that I should start for home within a few days, another that I was starting on the next morning from the time of the letter, and the third that I had left the castle. The first should be June 12th, the second June 19th, and the third June 29th. I now know the span of my life. God help me. 28th of May. There is a chance of escape, or at any rate of being able to send word home. A band of gypsies has come to the castle. I have written two letters. Mina's is in shorthand. I simply asked Mr. Hawkins to communicate with her. 
To her I have explained my situation, but without the horrors. I threw the letters through the bars of my window with a gold piece, and made what signs I could to have them posted. The man who took them pressed them to his heart and bowed. The Count has come. He sat down beside me, and said in his smoothest voice, as he opened two letters, The gypsy has given me these. One is from you to my friend Peter Hawkins. The other is a vile thing, an outrage upon friendship and hospitality. And he calmly held letter and envelope in the flame of the lamp till they were consumed. The letter to Hawkins, that I shall of course send on. Your letters are sacred to me. 31st of May This morning when I woke I thought I would provide myself with some paper and envelopes from my bag and keep them in my pocket so that I might write in case I should get an opportunity. But every scrap of paper was gone, and with it all that might be useful to me were I once outside the castle. 24th of June before morning Last night the Count left me early and locked himself into his own room. As soon as I dared, I ran up the winding stair. I had been there less than half an hour when I saw something coming out of the Count's window. I drew back and saw the whole man emerge. He had slung over his shoulder the terrible bag which I had seen the women take away. When a couple of hours had passed, I heard something stirring in the Count's room, something like a sharp wail quickly suppressed, and then there was silence. As I sat, I heard a sound in the courtyard, the agonized cry of a woman. Monster, give me my child! Somewhere high overhead, probably on the tower, I heard the voice of the Count. His call seemed to be answered from far and wide by the howling of wolves. There was no cry from the woman, and the howling of the wolves was but short. Before long they streamed away singly, licking their lips. 25th of June morning. It has only been at night that I have been molested or threatened. I have not yet seen the Count in the daylight. Can it be that he sleeps when others wake, that he may wake whilst they sleep? If I could only get into his room. There is a way, if one dares to take it. I have seen him crawl from his window. Why should not I imitate him and go in by his window? Same day, later. I have made the effort, and, God helping me, have come safely back. The room was empty. At one corner was a heavy door. It was open and led through a stone passage to a circular stairway which went steeply down. At the bottom I found myself in an old ruined chapel. The ground had recently been dug over, and the earth placed in great wooden boxes. I went down even into the vaults, where, in one of the great boxes, on a pile of the newly dug earth, lay the Count. He was either dead or asleep, for the eyes were open and stony, the cheeks had the warmth of life, and the lips were as red as ever, but there was no sign of movement. No pulse, no breath, no beating of the heart. I thought he might have the keys on him, but when I went to search I saw the dead eyes, and in them such a look of hate, that I fled from the place and, leaving the Count's room by the window, crawled again up the castle wall. 29th of June I was awakened by the Count, who looked at me grimly. Tomorrow, my friend, we must part. Your letter home has been dispatched. Tomorrow my carriage shall come for you and shall bear you to the Borgo Pass. Why may I not go tonight? Because, dear sir, my coachman and horses are away on the mission. But I would walk with pleasure. I want to get away at once. Hark! Close at hand came the howling of many wolves. It was almost as if the sound sprang up at the raising of his hand. The door began to open. The howling of the wolves without grew louder and angrier. I cried out, Shut the door, I shall wait till morning. 
and covered my face with my hands to hide the tears of bitter disappointment. 30th of June morning. I slept till just before the dawn. Then came the welcome cock crow, and I felt that I was safe. I ran down the hall, but the door would not move. It had been locked. A wild desire took me to obtain the key at any risk, and I determined then and there to scale the wall again. The great box was in the same place. There lay the Count. But the white hair and moustache were changed to dark iron grey. The cheeks were fuller, and the white skin seemed ruby red underneath. The mouth was redder than ever, for on the lips were gouts of fresh blood, which trickled from the corners of the mouth and ran over the chin and neck. It seemed as if the awful creature was simply gorged with blood. He lay like a filthy leech. A terrible desire came upon me to rid the world of such a monster. I seized a shovel which the workman had been using to fill the cases, and lifting it high, struck with the edge downward at the hateful face. But as I did so, the head turned, and the eyes fell full upon me. The sight seemed to paralyze me, and the shovel turned in my hand and glanced from the face, making a deep gash above the forehead. I ran from the place and gained the Count's room, but at that moment there seemed to come a violent puff of wind, and the door to the winding stair blew to with a shock that set the dust from the lintels flying. When I ran to push it open, I found that it was hopelessly fast. I was again a prisoner. Letter from Miss Mina Murray to Miss Lucy Westenra, 9th of May. My dearest Lucy, forgive my long delay in writing, but I have been working very hard lately, practising shorthand. When we are married I shall be able to be useful to Jonathan, and I can take down what he wants to say and write it out for him on the typewriter. I have just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan. He is well and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all his news. Your loving Mina. P.S. I hear rumours, and especially of a tall, handsome, curly-haired man. Letter, Lucy Westenra, to Mina Murray. My dearest Mina, town is very pleasant just now, and we go a good deal to picture galleries and for walks and rides in the park. As to the tall, curly-haired man, that was Arthur Holmwood. He often comes to see us, and he and Mamma get on very well together. We met some time ago a man that would just do for you, if you are not already engaged to Jonathan. He's a doctor, and really clever. He's only nine and twenty, and he has an immense lunatic asylum all under his own care. He says that I afford him a curious psychological study, and I humbly think I do. I do not, as you know, take sufficient interest in dress to be able to describe the new fashions. Dress is a bore. That's slang. But never mind. Arthur says that every day. There. It is all out. Oh, Mina, couldn't you guess? I love him. I'm blushing as I write, for although I think he loves me, he has not told me so in words. But, oh, Mina, I love him. Let me hear from you at once, and tell me all that you think about it. Lucy. Letter, Lucy Westenra, to Mina Murray, 24th May. My dearest Mina, my dear, it never rains but it pours. I never had a proposal till today, not a real proposal, and today I've had three. Three proposals in one day. Number one came just before lunch. Dr. John Seward, the lunatic asylum man. He told me how dear I was to him, and what his life would be with me to help and cheer him. He was going to tell me how unhappy he would be if I did not care for him. But when he saw me cry, he asked me if I cared already for anyone else. And then, Mina, I felt it a sort of duty to tell him that there was someone. He said he hoped I would be happy, and that if I ever wanted a friend, I must count him one of my best. Number two came after lunch. He's such a nice fellow. Mr. Quincy P. Morris from Texas. And he looks so young and fresh that it seems almost impossible that he has been to so many places and has had such adventures. Well, Mr. Morris sat down beside me, took my hand in his, and said ever so sweetly, Lucy, you are an honest-hearted girl, I know. Tell me, like one good fellow to another, is there anyone else that you care for? And if there is, I'll never trouble you a hair's breadth again. 
but will be, if you will let me, a very faithful friend. I told him out straight, yes, there is someone I love, though he has not told me yet that he even loves me. He put out both his hands and took mine, and said in a very hearty way, That's my brave girl. It's better worth being late for a chance of winning you than being in time for any other girl in the world. He wrung my hand, and taking up his hat, went straight out of the room without looking back, without a tear or a quiver or a pause. Ever your loving Lucy. P.S. I needn't tell you of number three, need I? Besides, it was all so confused. It seemed only a moment from Arthur coming into the room till both his arms were round me and he was kissing me. I am very, very happy, and I don't know what I have done to deserve it. Dr. Seward's Diary, 25th of April Since my rebuff of yesterday, I have a sort of empty feeling. As I knew that the only cure for this sort of thing was work, I went down amongst the patients. I picked out one who has afforded me a study of much interest. R. M. Renfield, age 59, sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable, periods of gloom ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out. A possibly dangerous man. Mina Murray's journal, 24th of July, Whitby. Lucy met me at the station, looking sweeter and lovelier than ever, and we drove up to the house at the Crescent, in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a deep valley which broadens out as it comes near the harbour. Right over the town is Whitby Abbey. It is the most noble ruin, of immense size, and full of beautiful and romantic bits. Between it and the town there is another church, the parish one, round which is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. This is, to my mind, the nicest spot in Whitby, for it lies right over the town and has a full view of the harbour. I shall come and sit here very often myself and work. Indeed, I am writing now, with my book on my knee, and listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting beside me. 1st of August I came up here an hour ago with Lucy, looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She's got a beautiful colour since she's been here. We sat a while, and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat, and she told me all over again about Arthur and their coming marriage. That made me just a little heartsick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. Dr. Seward's Diary, 5th of June The case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. He has certain qualities very largely developed, selfishness, secrecy, and purpose. He seems to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is I do not yet know. Just now his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to expostulate. He did not break out into a fury, as I expected, but thought for a moment, and then said, May I have three days? I shall clear them away. Of course, I said, that would do. I must watch him. 18th June he has turned his mind now to spiders, and has got several very big fellows in a box. He keeps feeding them with his flies, and the number of the latter is becoming diminished. 1st of July His spiders are now becoming as great a nuisance as his flies, and today I told him that he must get rid of them. He looked very sad at this, so I said he must clear out some of them at all events. He disgusted me much while with him. For when a horrid blowfly buzzed into the room, he caught it between his finger and thumb, and before I knew what he was going to do, put it into his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued quietly that it was life, strong life, and gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudiment of one. I must watch how he gets rid of his spiders. 8th of July There is a method in his madness, and the rudimentary idea in my mind is growing. He has managed to get a sparrow, and has already partially tamed it. His means of taming is simple, for already the spiders have diminished. Those that do remain, however, are well fed, for he still brings in the flies by tempting them with his food. 19th July. We are progressing. 
My friend has now a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me and said he wanted to ask me a great favour. I asked him what it was, and he said with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, A kitten, a nice little sleek playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed and feed and feed. I asked him if he would not rather have a cat than a kitten. His eagerness betrayed him. Oh, yes, I would like a cat. I only asked for a kitten, lest you should refuse me a cat. I shook my head and said that at present I feared it would not be possible, but that I would see about it. His face fell, and I could see a warning of danger in it for there was a sudden, fierce, sidelong look which meant killing. 20th July Visited Renfield very early. Found him up and humming a tune. I looked around for his birds, and not seeing them, asked where they were. He replied that they had all flown away. There were a few feathers about the room, and on his pillow a drop of blood. I said nothing. 11 a.m. The attendant has just been to see me to say that Renfield has been very sick and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief is, doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds and that he just took and ate them raw. 11 p.m. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight, enough to make even him sleep. My homicidal maniac is of a peculiar kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him, and call him a zoophagus, life-eating maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider, and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat the many birds. What would have been his later steps? It would almost be worth while to complete the experiment. Mina Murray's Journal, 26th of July. I had not heard from Jonathan for some time, and was very concerned. But yesterday, dear Mr. Hawkins, who is always so kind, sent me a letter from him. It is only a line dated from Castle Dracula, and says that he is just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me uneasy. Then, too, Lucy, although she is so well, has lately taken to her old habit of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we have decided that I am to lock the door of our room every night. Lucy is to be married in the autumn, and she is already planning out her dresses and how her house is to be arranged. I sympathize with her, for I do the same. Mr. Holmwood is coming up here very shortly, and I think dear Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. 27th July No news from Jonathan. I am getting quite uneasy about him. Though why I should, I do not know. But I do wish that he would write, if it were only a single line. Lucy sleepwalks more than ever, and each night I am wakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately, the weather is so warm that she cannot get cold. But I am getting nervous and wakeful myself. 3rd of August. Another week gone and no news from Jonathan. Oh, I do hope he is not ill. He surely would have written. I look at that last letter of his. It does not read like him, and yet it is his writing. Lucy has not walked much in her sleep the last week, but even in her sleep she seems to be watching me. 6th of August Another three days and no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If I only knew where to write to or where to go to, I should feel easier. But no one has heard a word of Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last night was very threatening, and the fishermen say that we are in for a storm. The clouds are piled up like giant rocks. Dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist. The fishing boats are racing for home, and rise and dip in the ground swell as they sweep into the harbour. The coast guard came along with his spyglass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me, as he always does, but all the time looking at a strange ship. "'I can't make her out,' he said. "'She's a Russian by the look of her. She seems to see the storm coming, but doesn't know her mind a bit. 
She can't decide whether to run up north in the open or put in here. Look, there again. She steered mighty strangely, for she doesn't mind land on the wheel. Changes about with every puff of wind. We'll hear more of her before this time tomorrow. Cutting from the Daily Graph, 8th of August, pasted in Mina Murray's journal, from a correspondent, Whitby. One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The wind fell away entirely during the evening. There was a dead calm, a sultry heat. The only ship noticeable was a foreign schooner with all sails set, which was seemingly going westwards. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. White-crested waves beat madly on the level sands and rushed up the shelving cliffs. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea fog came drifting inland, white, wet clouds which swept by in ghostly fashion. On the summit of the east cliff, the new searchlight was ready for experiment, but had not yet been tried. The officers in charge of it got it into working order. Before long, the searchlight discovered some distance away a schooner, apparently the same vessel which had been noticed earlier in the evening. The wind suddenly shifted to the northeast. The remnant of the sea fog melted in the blast, and between the piers, at headlong speed, swept the strange schooner and gained the safety of the harbour. The searchlight followed her, and a shudder ran through all who saw her. For lashed to the helm was a corpse, with drooping head, which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. The schooner paused not, but rushing across the harbour, pitched herself on that accumulation of sand and gravel known locally as Tate Hill Pier. There was, of course, a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up on the sand heap, but strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below and jumped from the bow onto the sand, making straight for the steep cliff where the churchyard hangs over the laneway, it disappeared in the darkness. I was one of a small group who saw the dead seaman whilst actually lashed to the wheel. The man was simply fastened by his hands, tied one over the other to a spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and the wood was a crucifix. The coast guard said the man must have tied up his own hands, fastening the knots with his teeth. It turns out that the schooner is a Russian from Varna, and is called a Demeter, with only a small amount of cargo, a number of great wooden boxes filled with mould. This cargo was consigned to a Whitby solicitor, who this morning went aboard and formally took possession of the goods. A good deal of interest was abroad concerning the dog which landed when the ship struck. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it made its way onto the moors, where it is still hiding. There are some who look with dread on such a possibility, for it is evidently a fierce brute. Early this morning a large dog belonging to the coal merchant was found dead in the roadway. It had been fighting, and manifestly had had a savage opponent, for its throat was torn away and its belly slit open, as if with a savage claw. Mina Murray's Journal, 8th of August Lucy was very restless all night, and I too could not sleep. She got up twice and dressed herself. Fortunately, I awoke in time and managed to undress her without waking her and got her back to bed. 10th of August The funeral of the poor sea captain today was most touching. Every boat in the harbour seemed to be there, and the coffin was carried by captains all the way from Tate Hill Pier up to the churchyard. Poor Lucy seemed much upset. She was restless and uneasy all the time and I cannot but think that her dreaming at night is telling on her. The ship steered into port by a dead man, his attitude tied to the wheel with a crucifix and beads, the touching funeral, will all afford material for her dreams. Same day, eleven o'clock p.m. We had a lovely walk. Lucy is asleep and breathing softly. She has more colour in her cheeks than usual and looks, oh, so sweet. If Mr. Holmwood fell in love with her, seeing her only in the drawing-room, I wonder what he would say if he saw her now. 3 a.m. 
I fell asleep as soon as I had closed my diary. Suddenly I became broad awake and sat up with a horrible sense of fear upon me. The room was dark, so I could not see Lucy's bed. I lit a match and found that she was not in the room. I feared to wake her mother, who has been ill lately, so threw on some clothes and got ready to look for her. I ran downstairs and came to the hall door and found it open. I took a big heavy shawl and ran out. At the edge of the west cliff I looked across the harbour to the east cliff, in the hope, or fear, I don't know which, of seeing Lucy. Whatever my expectation was, it was not disappointed, for there, on our favourite seat, the silver light of the moon struck a half-reclining figure, snowy white. But it seemed to me as though something dark stood behind the seat where the white figure shone, and bent over it. The time and distance seemed endless, and my knees trembled and my breath came laboured as I toiled up the endless steps. When I got almost to the top, I could see the seat and the white figure. I called in fright, Lucy, Lucy! Something raised a head, and from where I was I could see a white face and red, gleaming eyes. Lucy did not answer, and I ran on to the entrance of the churchyard. As I entered, the church was between me and the seat. When I came in view again, she was quite alone, and there was not a sign of any living thing about. She was still asleep. Her lips were parted, and she was breathing in long, heavy gasps, as though striving to get her lungs full at every breath. I flung the warm shawl over her, and drew the edges tight round her neck. I fastened the shawl at her throat with a big safety pin. But I must have been clumsy in my anxiety, and pricked her with it, for she put her hand to her throat and moaned. I shook her forcibly, till finally she opened her eyes and awoke. Fortune favoured us, and we got home without meeting a soul. Same day, noon. All goes well. Lucy slept till I woke her. I was sorry to notice that my clumsiness with the safety pin hurt her, for the skin of her throat was pierced. There are two little red points like pinpricks, and on the band of her nightdress was a drop of blood. 13th of August. Again I woke in the night, and found Lucy sitting up in bed, still asleep, pointing to the window. I got up quietly, and pulling aside the blind, looked out. Between me and the moonlight flitted a great bat. Once or twice it came quite close, but was, I suppose, frightened at seeing me, and flitted away across the harbour towards the abbey. 14th of August. On the east cliff, reading and writing all day. We were coming home for dinner. The setting sun, low down in the sky, seemed to bathe everything in a beautiful rosy glow. Suddenly Lucy murmured as if to herself, His red eyes again. They are just the same. It was such an odd expression that it quite startled me. Lucy had a headache and went early to bed. I saw her asleep and went out for a little stroll. When coming home, it was then bright moonlight, I threw a glance up at our window and saw Lucy with her head lying up against the side of the window sill and her eyes shut. She was fast asleep, and by her, Seated on the window sill was something that looked like a good sized bird. As I came into the room, she was moving back to her bed, fast asleep and breathing heavily. She was holding her hand to her throat as though to protect it from cold. I tucked her up warmly. I have taken care that the door is locked and the window securely fastened. 17th of August. No news from Jonathan, and Lucy seems to be growing weaker. I do not understand Lucy's fading away as she is doing. She eats well and sleeps well and enjoys the fresh air, but all the time the roses in her cheeks are fading. I trust her feeling ill may not be from that unlucky prick of the safety pin. I looked at her throat just now as she lay asleep, and the tiny wounds seem not to have healed. They are still open and, if anything, larger. 18th of August. I am happy today. Lucy is ever so much better. Last night she slept well and did not disturb me once. 
The roses seem coming back already to her cheeks, though she is still sadly pale and wan-looking. I asked her if she had dreamed at all. I didn't quite dream, but it all seemed to be real. I have a vague memory of something long and dark with red eyes, just as we saw in the sunset, and something very sweet and very bitter all around me at once. And then I seemed sinking into deep green water. My soul seemed to go out from my body and float about the air, and then there was a sort of agonizing feeling, as if I were in an earthquake. And I came back and found you shaking my body. I saw you do it before I felt you. Then she began to laugh. I did not quite like it, and thought it better not to keep her mind on the subject. So we drifted on to others, and Lucy was like her old self again. 19th of August. Joy, joy, joy! At last news of Jonathan. The dear fellow has been ill. That is why he did not write. Hospital of St. Joseph and St. Mary, Budapest. 12th of August. Dear Madam, I write by desire of Mr. Jonathan Harker, who is himself not strong enough to write, though progressing well. He has been under our care for nearly six weeks, suffering from a violent brain fever. He will require some few weeks' rest in our sanatorium in the hills, but will then return. He has had some fearful shock, so says our doctor, and in his delirium his ravings have been dreadful, of wolves and poison and blood, of ghosts and demons, and I fear to say of what. Be assured that he is well cared for. He has won all hearts by his sweetness and gentleness. He is truly getting on well. Yours, with sympathy and all blessings, Sister Agatha. Dr. Seward's Diary, 19th of August Strange and sudden change in Renfield last night. About eight o'clock he began to get excited. All he would say was, The master is at hand. The attendant thinks it is some sudden form of religious mania. A strong man with homicidal and religious mania at once might be dangerous. The combination is a dreadful one. I had lain tossing about and had heard the clock strike only twice when the night watchman came to me to say that Renfield had escaped. I threw on my clothes and ran down at once. My patient is too dangerous a person to be roaming about. I ran as quickly as I could. As I got through the belt of trees, I saw a white figure scale the high wall which separates our grounds from those of the deserted house. On the far side of the house, I found him pressed close against the old iron-bound oak door of the chapel. He was talking, apparently, to someone. I heard him say, I am here to do your bidding, master. I am your slave, and you will reward me, for I shall be faithful. Now that you are near, I await your commands. When we closed in on him, he fought like a tiger. He is immensely strong, and he was more like a wild beast than a man. He's chained to the wall in the padded room. His cries are at times awful. He means murder in every turn and movement. Letter Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra, August the 24th, Budapest. My dearest Lucy, I found my dear one, oh, so thin and pale and weak-looking. Jonathan is only a wreck of himself, and he does not remember anything that has happened to him for a long time past. He has had some terrible shock. He asked me for his coat, as he wanted to get something from the pocket. Sister Agatha brought all his things. Amongst them was his notebook. He said to me very solemnly, The secret is here. Here is the book. Take it, and keep it, read it if you will, but never let me know. Sister Agatha has come and told me that the chaplain of the English Mission Church has been sent for. We are to be married in an hour. Dr. Seward's Diary, 23rd of August. The unexpected always happens. Another night adventure. Renfield artfully waited until the attendant was entering the room, then he dashed out past him and flew down the passage. Again we went into the ground of the deserted house, and we found him in the same place, pressed against the old chapel door. I caught the patient's eye and followed it, 
but could trace nothing as it looked into the moonlit sky except a big bat, which was flapping its silent and ghostly way as if it knew where it was bound for. Lucy Westenra's diary, Hillingham, the 25th of August. Last night I seemed to be dreaming again, just as I was at Whitby. There was a sort of scratching or flapping at the window, but I did not mind it, and I remember no more. More bad dreams. I wish I could remember them. This morning I am horribly weak. My face is ghastly pale, and my throat pains me. Letter Arthur Holmwood to Dr. Seward, Albemarle Hotel, the 31st of August. Dear Jack, I want you to do me a favour. Lucy is ill. She has no special disease, but she looks awful and is getting worse every day. I've asked her if there is any cause. I do not dare to ask her mother, for to disturb the poor lady's mind about her daughter in her present state of health would be fatal. Mrs. Weston Ra has confided to me that her doom is spoken. Disease of the heart though poor Lucy does not know it yet. You are to come to lunch at Hillingham tomorrow, and after lunch Lucy will take an opportunity of being alone with you. Letter from Dr. Seward to Arthur Holmwood, the 2nd of September. My dear old fellow, with regard to Miss Westenra's health, I could easily see she is somewhat bloodless, but I could not see the usual anemic signs. As there must be cause somewhere, I have come to the conclusion that it must be something mental. I am in doubt, and so have done the best thing I know of. I have written to my old friend and master, Professor Van Helsing of Amsterdam, who knows as much about obscure diseases as anyone in the world. I have asked him to come over. He is a philosopher and a metaphysician, and one of the most advanced scientists of his day. Yours always, John Seward. 3rd September My dear Arthur, Van Helsing made a very careful examination of the patient. He is, I fear, much concerned, but says he must think. And Lucy was more cheerful than on the day I first saw her, and certainly looked better, and her breathing was normal. She was very sweet to the professor, and tried to make him feel at ease, though I could see that the poor girl was making a hard struggle. I believe Van Helsing saw it too. Then he snapped his fingers at me and said, but how can he know anything of a young lady's? He has his madmans to play this, and to bring them back to happiness and to those that loved them. We will send him away to smoke the cigarette in the garden, whilst you and I have little talk all to ourselves. I took the hint, and strolled about, and presently the professor came to the window and called me in. I have made careful examination, but there is no functional cause. There has been blood loss, but the conditions of her are in no way anemic, and yet there is always cause for everything. I must go home and think. You must send to me the telegram every day, and if there be cause, I shall come again. Dr. Seward's Diary, 4th of September Zoophagus' patient still keeps up our interest. At five o'clock I looked in on him. He is back in his room with the window open. He has the sugar of his tea spread out on the window sill and is reaping quite a harvest of flies. He is putting them in a box as of old, and is already examining the corners of his room to find a spider. For a moment or two he looked very sad, and said in a sort of faraway voice, All over, all over, he has deserted me. No hope for me now unless I do it for myself. I wish I could fathom his mind. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam, the 6th of September. Terrible change for the worse. Come at once. Do not lose an hour. Dr. Seward's diary, the 7th of September. The first thing Van Helsing said to me when we met at Liverpool Street was, Have you said anything to our young friend Arthur, the lover of her? No, I said. I wrote him a letter simply telling him that you were coming. Van Helsing and I were shown up to Lucy's room. I was horrified when I saw her. She was ghastly, chalkily pale. The red seemed to have gone even from her lips and gums, and the bones of her face stood out prominently. Her breathing was painful to see or hear. Van Helsing beckoned to me, and we went 
gently out of the room. My God, he said, this is dreadful. There is no time to be lost. She will die for sheer want of blood. There must be a transfusion at once. Is it you or me? I am younger and stronger, Professor. It must be me. I went downstairs with him, and as we were going, there was a knock at the hall door. The maid opened the door, and Arthur stepped quickly in. Van Helsing said to him gravely, Sir, you have come in time. You are the lover of our dear miss. She is bad, very bad. You are to help her. What can I do? She wants blood, and blood she must have, or die. We are about to perform what we call transfusion. John was to give his blood, but now you are here, you are more good than us, who toil much in the world of thought. We all went up to Lucy's room. Van Helsing took some other things from his bag and mixed a narcotic, and coming over to the bed said cheerily, Now, little miss, here is your medicine. Drink it off like a good child. The time seemed endless until sleep began to flicker in her eyelids. Then, with swiftness, but with absolute method, Van Helsing performed the operation. As the transfusion went on, something like life seemed to come back to poor Lucy's cheeks. When all was over, I could see how much Arthur was weakened. I dressed the wound and took his arm to bring him away. Van Helsing adjusted the pillow to the patient's head. As he did so, the narrow black velvet band which she seemed always to wear round her throat was dragged a little up and showed a red mark. Van Helsing said nothing at the moment, but turned to me. Now, take down our brave young lover, give him of the port vine, and let him go home and rest easy in mind. When Arthur had gone, I went back to the room. Lucy was sleeping gently but her breathing was stronger. I asked the professor, in a whisper, What do you make of that mark on her throat? What do you make of it? Just over the external jugular vein there were two punctures, not large, but not wholesome-looking. The professor stood up. I must go back to Amsterdam tonight, he said. There are books and things there which I want. You keep watch. See that nothing disturbs her. I shall be back as soon as possible, and then we may begin. May begin? I said. What on earth do you mean? We shall see, he answered, as he hurried out. All night long I watched by her. She never stirred, but slept on and on in a deep, tranquil, life-giving, health-giving sleep. In the early morning her maid came, and I left her in her care and took myself back home. A telegram came from Van Helsing whilst I was at dinner, suggesting that I should be at Hillingham again tonight, and stating that he would join me early in the morning. I was pretty tired and worn out when I got to Hillingham. For two nights I had hardly had a wink of sleep. Lucy was up and in cheerful spirits. No sitting up tonight for you. You are worn out. I am quite well again. Indeed I am. It is I who will sit up with you. Then Lucy took me upstairs and showed me a room next her own, where a cosy fire was burning. Now, she said, you must stay here. I could not but acquiesce, for I was dog-tired. 10th of September. I was conscious of the professor's hand on my head, and started awake all in a second. And how is our patient? Well, when I left her, or rather when she left me, I answered, Come, let us see, he said, and together we went into the room. As I raised the blind, I heard the professor's exclamation of horror. Gott in Himmel! There on the bed, seemingly in a swoon, lay poor Lucy, more horribly white and wan-looking than ever. Even the lips were white, and the gum seemed to have shrunken back from the teeth. Van Helsing felt her heart and after a few moments of agonizing suspense said, It is not too late. It beats, oh, but feebly. All our work is undone. We must begin again. As he spoke, he was dipping into his bag and producing the instruments for transfusion. I rolled up my shirt sleeve. Without a moment's delay, we began. After a time, the professor said, That will do. 
Already? I remonstrated. You took a great deal more from Arthur. He is her lover, her fiancé. You have work, much work, to do for her and for others, and a present will suffice. When we stopped the operation, he attended to Lucy. By and by, he bound up my wound and sent me downstairs to get a glass of wine for myself. Lucy slept well into the day, and when she woke she was fairly well and strong, though not nearly so much as the day before. 11th September This afternoon I went over to Hillingham. Shortly after I had arrived, a big parcel from abroad came for the professor. He opened it and showed a great bundle of white flowers. These are for you, Miss Lucy, he said. For me? Oh, Dr. Van Helsing. Yes, my dear, these are medicines. Professor, I believe you are only putting up a joke on me. Why, these flowers are only common garlic. No trifling with me. I never jest. I only do for your good. See, I place them myself in your room. I make myself the wreath that you are to wear. We went into the room, taking the flowers with us. First he fastened up the windows and latched them securely. Next, taking a handful of the flowers, he rubbed them all over the sashes as though to ensure that every whiff of air that might get in would be laden with the garlic smell. When she was in bed, he came and himself fixed the wreath of garlic round her neck. The last words he said to her were, Take care you do not disturb it, and even if the room feel close, do not to-night open the window or the door. Dr. Seward's Diary 13th of September. Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham at eight o'clock. Mrs. Westenra greeted us warmly and said, You will be glad to know that Lucy is better. I was anxious about the dear child in the night, and the room was awfully stuffy. There were a lot of those horrible, strong-smelling flowers about everywhere. I feared that the heavy odour would be too much in her weak state, so I took them all away and opened a bit of the window to let in a little fresh air. I watched the professor's face, and saw it turn ashen grey. "'God! God! God!' he said. "'What have we done? What has this poor thing done that we are so sore beset?' He went to the hall door for his bag, and together we went up to Lucy's room. This time he did not start as he looked on the poor face with the same awful waxen pallor as before. Without a word, he went and locked the door, and then began to set out on the little table the instruments for yet another operation of transfusion of blood. Today, you must operate. I shall provide. Again the operation. Again the narcotic. Again some return of colour to the ashy cheeks and the regular breathing of healthy sleep. Lucy Westenra's Diary, 17th of September Four days and nights of peace. I am getting so strong again that I hardly know myself. Since Dr. Van Helsing has been with me, all this bad dreaming seems to have passed away. The noises that used to frighten me out of my wits have all ceased. Dr. Seward's Diary, 17th September After dinner the door was burst open, and in rushed Renfield, his face distorted with passion. He had a dinner knife in his hand. Before I could get my balance, he had struck at me and cut my left wrist rather severely. When the attendants rushed in, he was lying on his belly on the floor, licking up, like a dog, the blood which had fallen from my wounded wrist. He was easily secured, and to my surprise went with the attendants quite placidly, simply repeating over and over again, The blood is the life, the blood is the life. Telegram Van Helsing to Seward, 17th of September. Do not fail to be at Hillingham tonight. Shall be with you as soon as possible after arrival. Memorandum by Lucy Westenra, 17th of September, night. I feel I am dying of weakness. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the flowers were placed as Dr. Van Helsing directed, 
and soon fell asleep. I was waked by the flapping at the window, which now I know so well. I went to the window and looked out, but could see nothing except a big bat which had evidently been buffeting its wings against the window. Presently the door opened, and Mother looked in. I was uneasy about you, darling, and came in to see that you were all right. I feared she might catch cold, and asked her to come in and sleep with me. As she lay there in my arms and I in hers, the flapping and buffeting came to the window again. And shortly after there was a crash at the window, and a lot of broken glass was hurled on the floor. The window blind blew back with the wind that rushed in, and in the aperture of the broken panes there was the head of great, gaunt, grey wolf. Mother cried out in fright. For a second or two she sat up, pointing at the wolf, and there was a strange and horrible gurgling in her throat. Then she fell over as if struck with lightning, and her head hit my forehead and made me dizzy for a moment or two. I kept my eyes fixed on the window, but the wolf drew his head back, and a whole myriad of little specks seemed to come blowing in through the broken windows, and wheeling and circling like a pillar of dust. I tried to stir, but dear mother's poor body, which seemed to grow cold already, for her dear heart had ceased to beat, weighed me down. The sound seemed to have wakened the maids, too, for I could hear their bare feet pattering outside my door. I called to them, and they came in. They lifted off the body of my dear mother and laid her, covered up with a sheet, on the bed after I had got up. They were all so frightened and nervous that I directed them to go to the dining room and have each a glass of wine. I was surprised that the maids did not come back. I called them, but got no answer, so I went to the dining room to look for them. My heart sank when I saw what had happened. They all four lay helpless on the floor, breathing heavily. I was suspicious and examined the decanter. It smelt of laudanum. Dr. Seward's Diary, 18th of September I drove at once to Hillingham. I met Van Helsing running up the avenue. In the dining room we found four servant women lying on the floor. Their stertorous breathing and the acrid smell of laudanum in the room left no doubt as to their condition. We ascended to Lucy's room. On the bed lay two women, Lucy and her mother. The latter lay farthest in, and she was covered with a white sheet. By her side lay Lucy, with face white and still more drawn. Her throat was bare, showing the two little wounds which we had noticed before, but looking horribly white and mangled. It is not yet too late. Quick, quick, bring the brandy. I flew downstairs and returned with it. He rubbed the brandy on her lips and gums. Lucy's heart beat a trifle more audibly to the stethoscope, and her lungs had a perceptible movement. Van Helsing was evidently torturing his mind about something. What are we to do now? Where are we to turn for help? We must have another transfusion of blood, and that soon or that poor girl's life won't be worth an hour's purchase. You are exhausted already. I am exhausted too. What's the matter with me, anyhow? The voice came from across the room, and its tones brought relief and joy to my heart. I cried out, Quincy, Morris, what brought you here? I guess Arthur is the cause. He handed me a telegram. I've not heard from Seward for three days, and I'm terribly anxious. Send me word how Lucy is. Do not delay Arthur Homewood. Van Helsing took his hand. A brave man's blood is the best thing on this earth when a woman is in trouble. Once again we went through that ghastly operation. Her struggle back into life was something frightful to see and hear. I went out and arranged with a local undertaker to come up in the evening to measure for the coffin for Mrs. Westenra. When I got back, Quincy was waiting for me. Jack, what is it that's wrong with her? The Dutchman said she must have another transfusion of blood, and that both you and he were exhausted. I take it that both you and Van Helsing had done already what I did today. That's so. And I guess Arthur was in it too. I answered in the same phrase. That's so. Then I guess that poor pretty creature has had put into her veins within that time the blood of four strong men. Man alive! 
Her whole body wouldn't hold it. What took it out? That, I said, is the crux. I can't even hazard a guess. 19th of September All last night she slept fitfully. Whilst asleep she looked stronger, although more haggard, and her breathing was softer. Her open mouth showed the pale gums drawn back from the teeth, which thus looked positively longer and sharper than usual. In the afternoon she asked for Arthur, and we telegraphed for him. When he arrived, Arthur was simply choked with emotion, and none of us could speak. I fear that tomorrow will end our watching, for the shock has been too great. The poor child cannot rally. God help us all. Letter, Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra, 17th of September. My dearest Lucy, it seems an age since I heard from you, or indeed since I wrote. Well, I got my husband back all right. When we arrived at Exeter, there was a carriage waiting for us, and in it, Mr. Hawkins. He took us to his own house, and we dined together. I wish I could run up to town for a day or two to see you, dear, but Jonathan wants looking after still. He was terribly weakened by the long illness. Yours, Mina Harker. Report from Dr. Patrick Hennessy to John Seward, M.D. 20th of September. My dear sir, with regard to patient Renfield, there is more to say. This afternoon a carrier's cart made a call at the empty house whose grounds abut on ours. As he passed the window of Renfield's room, the patient began to rate him from within and called him all the foul names he could lay his tongue to. Within half an hour I heard him again. He had broken out through the window of his room and was running down the avenue. I saw the same cart which had passed before coming down the road, having on it some great wooden boxes. Before I could get up to him, the patient rushed at the men, pulling one of them off the cart. As we began to master him, and the attendants were putting a straight waistcoat on him, he began to shout, They shan't rob me! I'll fight for my lord and master! And all sorts of similar incoherent ravings. It was with very considerable difficulty that they got him back to the house and put him in the padded room. Letter, Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra, 18th of September. My dearest Lucy, such a sad blow has befallen us. Mr. Hawkins has died very suddenly. Jonathan is greatly distressed. I dread coming up to London, as we must do the day after tomorrow, for poor Mr. Hawkins left in his will that he was to be buried in the grave with his father. I shall try to run over to see you, dearest, if only for a few minutes. With all blessings, your loving Mina. Dr. Seward's Diary, 20th of September at six o'clock, Van Helsing came to relieve me. He bent down, removed the flowers, and lifted the silk handkerchief from Lucy's throat. As he did so, he started back, and I could hear his ejaculation. Mein Gott! The wounds on the throat had completely disappeared. He turned to me and said calmly, She is dying. It will not be long now. Wake that poor boy and let him come and see the last. He trusts us, and we have promised him. When he came into the room, she opened her eyes and said in a soft, voluptuous voice such as I had never heard from her lips, Arthur, oh, my love, I am so glad you have come. Kiss me. But at that instant... Van Helsing swooped upon him, and catching him by the neck with both hands, dragged him back with a fury of strength which I never thought he could have possessed. Not for your life, he said. Not for your living soul and hers. And he stood between them like a lion at bay. I saw a spasm as of rage flit like a shadow over her face. The sharp teeth champed together. Very shortly after, she opened her eyes in all their softness and took Van Helsing's hand. Drawing it to her, she kissed it. My true friend, she said in a faint voice. And then Lucy's breathing became stertorous again, and all at once it ceased. It is all over, said Van Helsing. She is dead. I stood beside Van Helsing and said, Poor girl, there is peace for her at last. It is the end. Not so, 
Alas, not so. It is only the beginning. When I asked him what he meant, he answered, Wait and see. Dr. Seward's Diary, the 20th of September The funeral was arranged for the next succeeding day, so that Lucy and her mother might be buried together. Before turning in, we went to look at poor Lucy. The undertaker had certainly done his work well. All Lucy's loveliness had come back to her in death. The professor looked sternly grave. Tomorrow I want you to bring me, before night, a set of post-mortem knives. Must we make an autopsy? I asked. Yes and no. I want to operate, but not as you think. Let me tell you now, but not a word to another. I want to cut off her head and take out her heart. We shall unscrew the coffin lid and shall do our operation and then replace all so that none know save we alone. But why? Why mutilate her poor body without need? Why do it? Friend John, let us not be two, but one. That so we work to a good end. Will you not have faith in me? I took his hand and promised him. I must have slept long and soundly. Van Helsing waked me by coming into my room. You need not trouble about the knives. We shall not do it. Is it too late? See. He held up a little golden crucifix. This was stolen in the night. How stolen? I asked in wonder. Since you have it now. Because I get it back from the worthless wretch who stole it. From the maid who robbed the dead and the living. Arthur arrived at five o'clock. He looked desperately sad and broken. I felt he would like to be quite alone with her, but he took my arm and led me in, saying huskily, Oh, Jack, there is nothing in the wide world for me to live for. I said softly, Come and look at her. Together we moved over to the bed. God, how beautiful she was. Every hour seemed to be enhancing her loveliness. We all dined together and I could see that poor Arthur was trying to make the best of things. Van Helsing had been silent all dinner time, but when we had lit our cigars, he said, May I ask you something now, Arthur? Certainly. I want you to give me permission to read all Miss Lucy's papers and letters. I have them all here. Dr. Van Helsing, you may do what you will. I feel that in saying this I am doing what my dear one would have approved. I slept on a sofa in Arthur's room that night. Van Helsing did not go to bed at all. He went to and fro, as if patrolling the house, and was never out of sight of the room where Lucy lay in her coffin. Mina Harker's Journal, the 22nd of September The service was very simple and very solemn. There were only ourselves and the servants there, and one or two old friends of Mr. Hawkins from Exeter. We came back to town quietly, taking a bus, and were walking down Piccadilly, when I felt Jonathan clutch my arm so tight that he hurt me. He said, under his breath, My God! He was very pale, and his eyes seemed bulging out as, half in terror and half in amazement, he gazed at a tall, thin man with a beaky nose, black moustache, and pointed beard. His face was cruel and sensual, and his big white teeth were pointed like an animal's. Jonathan said, I believe it is the Count, but he has grown young. My God, if this be so! Oh, my God! If I only knew! If I only knew! Dr. Seward's Diary, the 22nd of September It is all over. Arthur has gone home and has taken Quincy Morris with him. Van Helsing goes over to Amsterdam tonight, but says he returns tomorrow. I fear that the strain of the past week has broken down even his iron strength. And now we are all scattered, and for many a long day loneliness will sit over our roofs with brooding wings. Lucy lies in the tomb of her kin, a lordly death house in a lonely churchyard, away from teeming London, where the air is fresh, 
when the sun rises over Hampstead Hill, and where wild flowers grow of their own accord. The Westminster Gazette, the 25th of September, A Hampstead Mystery. During the past two or three days, several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or neglecting to return from playing on the heath. Some of the children, indeed all who have been missed at night, have been slightly torn or wounded in the throat. Mina Harker's Journal, 23rd of September. Jonathan will be away all day till late, so I shall take his foreign journal and read it. 24th September. Poor dear, how he must have suffered, whether it be true or only imagination. And yet that man we saw yesterday, that fearful count was coming to London with its teeming millions. There may be a solemn duty. I shall be prepared. I shall get my typewriter this very hour and begin transcribing. Then we shall be ready for other eyes if required. Letter Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker, 24th September. Dear Madam, I pray you to pardon my writing, in that I am so far, friend, as that I send to you sad news of Miss Lucy Westenra's death. May it be that I see you? You can trust me. I am a friend of Dr. John Seward. Mina Harker's Journal, 25th of September. It was half-past two o'clock when the knock came. Mary opened the door and announced, Dr. Van Helsing. I rose and bowed, and he came towards me a man of medium height, strongly built, with his shoulders set back. Mrs. Harker, is it not? I bowed assent. I have read your letters to Miss Lucy. I know that you were with her at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary, and in that diary she traces by inference certain things to a sleepwalking in which she puts down that you saved her. I ask you out of your so much kindness to tell me all of it that you remember. I can tell you, I think, Dr. Van Helsing, all about it. And your husband? Tell me of him. Is he quite well? Is all the fever gone, and is he strong and healthy? He has almost recovered. But when we were in town on Thursday last, he had a sort of a shock. He thought he saw someone who recalled something terrible, something which led to his brain fever. And here the whole thing seemed to overwhelm me in a rush. I threw myself on my knees and implored him to make my husband well again. I promise you that I will gladly do all for him that I can. Now you must eat. You are overwrought and perhaps over-anxious. After lunch, when we went back to the drawing-room, I said, Dr. Van Helsing, what I have to tell you is so queer that you must not laugh at me or at my husband. I shall give you a paper to read. It is long, but I have typewritten it out. It will tell you my trouble and Jonathan's. It is a copy of his journal when abroad. I dare not say anything of it. You will read for yourself and judge. He took the papers with him and went away. Letter Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker, the 25th of September. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. It may be worse for others, but for him and you there is no dread. I shall have much to ask him of other things. I am blessed that today I come to see you, for I have learned all at once so much. Yours the most faithful, Abraham Van Helsing. Jonathan Harker's Journal, the 26th of September When I got home last night, Mina told me of Van Helsing's visit. She showed me in the doctor's letter that all I wrote down was true. It seems to have made a new man of me, but now that I know, I am not afraid, even of the Count. He has succeeded, after all, then, in his design in getting to London, and it was him I saw. He has got younger, and how? Van Helsing is the man to unmask him and hunt him out. He was, I think, surprised to see me. But Madame Mina told me you are ill but you had had a shock. I was ill. I have had a shock. But you have cured me already. And how? By your letter to Mina last night. And now, he said, may I ask you for some more help? Can you tell me what went before your going to Transylvania? 
Later on I may ask more help and of a different kind, but at first this will do. Look here, sir, I said. Does what you have to do concern the Count? It does, he said solemnly. Then I am with you, heart and soul. Dr. Seward's Diary, 26th of September Until this afternoon I had no cause to think of what is done. Everything is, however, now reopened, and what is to be the end God only knows. Van Helsing thinks he knows too. Today he almost bounded into my room and thrust last night's Westminster Gazette into my hand. What do you think of that? He pointed out a paragraph about children being decoyed away at Hampstead. It did not convey much to me until I reached a passage where it described small, punctured wounds on their throats. An idea struck me. It is like poor Lucy's. And what do you make of it? Whatever it was that injured her has injured them. Do you mean to tell me, friend John, that you have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of? Of nervous prostration following on great loss or waste of blood. And how the blood lost or waste? I shook my head. You are a clever man, friend John. You reason well and your wit is bold. But you are too prejudiced. You do not let your eyes see nor your ears hear. That which is outside your daily life is not of account to you. I suppose now you do not believe in materialization, no, nor in the reading of thought, no, nor in hypnotism. Can you tell me why in the pampas and elsewhere there are bats that come at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry their blood? How in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on the trees all day, and when the sailors sleep on the deck, flit down on them, and then in the morning are found dead men, white as even Miss Lucy was? Good God, Professor, I said, starting up. Do you mean to tell me that Lucy was bitten by such a bat, and that such a thing is here in London in the nineteenth century? I had a dim idea that he was teaching me some lesson, as long ago he used to do in his study at Amsterdam. Professor, let me be your pet student again. Tell me the thesis, so that I may apply your knowledge as you go on. Ah, you are my favorite pupil still. It is worth to teach you. You think that those so small holes in the children's thoughts were made by the same that made the holes in Miss Lucy? You are wrong. Would it were so? But alas, no. It is worse. Far. Far this. In God's name, Professor Van Helsing, what do you mean? He threw himself with a despairing gesture into a chair, covering his face with his hands as he spoke. They were made by Miss Lucy. <laughs> Dr. Seward's Diary, 26th of September. The holes in the children's throats were made by Miss Lucy. For a while sheer anger mastered me. It was as if he had during a life struck Lucy on the face. Dr. Van Helsing, are you mad? He raised his head and looked at me, and somehow the tenderness of his face calmed me at once. Would I were, he said. Madness were easy to bear compared with truth like this. Tonight I go to prove it. Dare you to come with me? He took a key from his pocket and held it up. We spend the night, you and I, in the churchyard where Lucy lies. This is the key that locked the tomb. About ten o'clock we started. As we went further we met fewer and fewer people, till at last we reached the wall of the churchyard which we climbed over. With some little difficulty, for it was very dark, we found the western Ra tomb. The professor took the key, opened the creaky door, and motioned me to precede him. Then he fumbled in his bag, and taking out a matchbox and a piece of candle, proceeded to make a light. Van Helsing went about his work systematically. Holding his candle so that he could read the coffin plates, he made assurance of Lucy's. Another search in his bag, and he took out a turnscrew. What are you going to do? To open the coffin. You shall yet be convinced. 
straightway began taking out the screws, and finally lifted off the lid, showing the casing of lead beneath. He sawed down a couple of feet along one side of the lead coffin, and then across and down the other side. Taking the edge of the loose flange, he bent it back towards the foot of the coffin, and holding up the candle into the aperture, motioned me to look. I drew near and looked. The coffin was empty. He put on the lid again and went out. Then he told me to watch at one side of the churchyard, whilst he would watch at the other. It was a lonely vigil. I heard a distant clock strike twelve, and in time came one and two. Suddenly, as I turned round, I thought I saw something like a white streak moving between two dark trees at the side of the churchyard. A white, dim figure flitted in the direction of the tomb. I heard the rustle of actual movement where I had first seen the white figure, and coming over found the professor holding in his arms a tiny, sleeping child. We went into a clump of trees and struck a match and looked at the child's throat. It was without a scratch or scar of any kind. We were just in time, said the professor thankfully. At the edge of Hampstead Heath we heard a policeman's heavy tramp, and laying the child on the pathway, we waited and watched until he saw it, and then we went away silently. I must try to get a few hours' sleep, as Van Helsing insists that I shall go with him on another expedition. 27 September Once in the tomb, Van Helsing walked over to Lucy's coffin and again forced back the leaden flange. There lay Lucy, seemingly as we had seen her the night before her funeral. She was, if possible, more radiantly beautiful than ever, and I could not believe that she was dead. The professor pulled back the dead lips and showed the white teeth. See, they are sharper than before. With this, and this, he touched the canine teeth, the little children can be bitten. Are you of belief now, friend John? She has been dead one week. Most people in that time would not look so. It make hard that I must kill her in her sleep. This turned my blood cold. I shall cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic, and I shall drive a stake through her body. It made me shudder to think of so mutilating the body of the woman whom I had loved. My mind is made up. Let us go. Tomorrow I shall send for Arthur, and also that so fine young man of America that gave his blood. Later we shall all have work to do. So we locked the tomb and came away. 29th September, morning. Last night, a little before ten o'clock, Arthur and Quincy came into Van Helsing's room. He told us all what he wanted us to do, but especially addressing himself to Arthur. I want your permission to do what I think good this night. I want you to come with me, and to come in secret, to the churchyard at Kingstead. And when there? To enter the tomb. And when in the tomb? To open the coffin. This is too much! Would it not be well to hear what I have to say? Miss Lucy is dead, is it not so? Yes. Then there can be no wrong to her. But if she be not dead... Arthur jumped to his feet. Good God! What do you mean? Has there been any mistake? Has she been buried alive? I did not say that she was alive. I did not think it. I go no further than to say that she might be undead. Undead? Not alive? What do you mean? There are mysteries which men can only guess at. But I have not done. May I cut off the head of dead Miss Lucy? Heavens and earth, no! cried Arthur in a storm of passion. Dr. Van Helsing, you try me too far. Van Helsing rose up and said sternly, I too have a duty to do, a duty to others, a duty to you, a duty to the dead, and by God I shall do it. All I ask you now is that you come with me, that you look and listen. It was just a quarter before twelve o'clock when we got into the churchyard. The professor unlocked the tomb, and the rest of us followed, and he closed the door. He took his screwdriver and again took off the lid of the coffin. Van Helsing forced back the leaden flange, and we all looked in and recoiled. The coffin 
was empty. The silence was broken by Quincy Morris. Professor, is this your doing? I swear to you that I have not removed nor touched her. Two nights ago my friend Seward and I came here. I opened that coffin, and we found it as now empty. We then waited, and saw something white coming through the trees. The next day we came here in daytime, and she lay there. He opened the door, and we filed out, he coming last and locking the door behind him. Van Helsing took from his bag a mass of what looked like thin, wafer-like biscuit. He crumbled the wafer up fine, and worked it into the crevices between the door and its setting in the tomb. I am closing the tomb so that the undead may not enter. What is that which you are using? The question was by Arthur. The host, the bread of the Holy Communion. There was a long spell of silence, a big, aching void, and then far down the avenue of yews we saw a white figure advance, which held something at its breast. We could not see the face, for it was bent down over what we saw to be a fair-haired child. My own heart grew cold as ice, and I could hear the gasp of Arthur as we recognized the features of Lucy Westenra. Van Helsing stepped out, raised his lantern, and drew the slide. By the light that fell on Lucy's face, we could see that the lips were crimson with fresh blood. When Lucy saw us, she drew back with an angry snarl. With a careless motion, she flung to the ground the child. It gave a sharp cry and lay there, moaning. There was a cold-bloodedness in the act which wrung a groan from Arthur. She advanced to him with outstretched arms and a wanton smile. Come to me, Arthur. Leave these others and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come, my husband, come. As for Arthur, he opened wide his arms. Van Helsing sprang forward and held between them his little golden crucifix. She recoiled from it and dashed past him as if to enter the tomb. Within a foot or two of the door, she stopped as if arrested by some irresistible force. Van Helsing broke the silence by asking Arthur, Answer me. Am I to proceed in my work? Arthur hid his face as he answered, Do as you will, friend. Do as you will. There can be no horror like this ever any more. Van Helsing began to remove from the chinks some of the sacred emblem. We all looked on in horrified amazement as we saw the woman pass in where scarce a knife blade could have gone. We all felt a sense of relief when we saw the professor calmly restoring the strings of putty to the edges of the door. When this was done, he lifted the child and said, Come now, we can do no more till tomorrow. 30th of September a little after twelve noon, we followed the professor to the tomb. When he again lifted the lid off Lucy's coffin, we all saw that the body lay there in all its death beauty. Van Helsing began taking the various contents from his bag. His operating knives and a round wooden stake about three feet long sharpened to a fine point. With this stake came a heavy hammer. When all was ready, Van Helsing said, let me tell you this. All that die from the praying of the undead become themselves undead and prey on their kind. Those children whose blood she suck, if she live on more and more they lose their blood, and by her power over them they come to her. If she die, then all cease, the tiny wounds of the throats disappear. But of the most blessed of all, when this now undead be made to rest as true dead, the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall again be free. It will be a blessed hand for her that shall strike the blow that sets her free. We all looked at Arthur. He stepped forward and said bravely, Tell me what I am to do, and I shall not falter. Take this stake in your left hand, ready to place the point over the heart, and the hammer in your right. Then, when we begin our prayer for the dead, strike in God's name. Van Helsing opened his missal and began to read. Arthur placed the point over her heart, and then he struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed. 
and a hideous, blood-curdling screech came from the opened red lips. The body shook and quivered and twisted in wild contortions. The sharp white teeth champed together till the lips were cut and the mouth was smeared with a crimson foam. But Arthur never faltered, driving deeper and deeper the mercy-bearing stake, whilst the blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted up around it. And then the writhing and quivering of the body became less, and finally it lay still. The hammer fell from Arthur's hand. He reeled, and would have fallen had we not caught him. For a few minutes we were so taken up with him that we did not look towards the coffin. When we did, however, there lay no longer the foul thing that we had so dreaded, but Lucy as we had seen her in her life, with her face of unequalled sweetness and purity. Van Helsing came and laid his hand on Arthur's shoulder and said to him, And now, Arthur, my friend, you may kiss her. No longer she is the devil's undead. Arthur bent and kissed her and then we sent him and Quincy out of the tomb. The professor and I sawed the top off the stake, leaving the point of it in the body. Then we cut off her head and filled the mouth with garlic. We screwed on the coffin lid and came away. Van Helsing said, One step of our work is done, but there remains a greater task, to find out the author of all this our sorrow, and to stamp him out. Dr. Seward's Diary, 30th of September When we arrived at the Barclay Hotel, Van Helsing found a telegram waiting for him. I'm coming up by train, Jonathan at Whitby. Important news, Mina Harker. The professor was delighted. She arrived, but I cannot stay. She must go to your house, friend John. You must meet her at the station. When the wire was dispatched, he had a cup of tea. Over it he told me of a diary kept by Jonathan Harker when abroad, and gave me a typewritten copy of it, as also of Mrs. Harker's diary at Whitby. I took my way to Paddington. I got her luggage, which included a typewriter, and we took the underground to Fenchurch Street. In due time we arrived. She knew, of course, that the place was a lunatic asylum, but I could see that she was unable to repress a slight shudder when we entered. Mina Harker's Journal I went down to Dr. Seward's study. At the door I paused a moment. However, on his calling out, come in, I entered. Dr. Seward, you helped to attend dear Lucy at the end. Let me hear how she died. She was very, very dear to me. No, no, no. For all the world, I wouldn't let you know that terrible story. Then it was terrible. My intuition was right. My eyes lit on the great batch of typewriting on the table. You do not know me, I said. When you have read those papers, my own diary and my husband's also, which I have typed, you will know me better. After dinner, I came with Dr. Seward to his study. When the terrible story of Lucy's death and all that followed was done, I lay back in my chair powerless. My brain was all in a whirl. But through all the multitude of horrors came the holy ray of light that my dear, dear Lucy was at last at peace. I took the cover off my typewriter and said to Dr. Seward, Let me write this all out now. We must be ready for Dr. Van Helsing when he comes. In this matter, dates are everything. If we get all our material ready and in chronological order, we shall have much done. Dr. Seward's Diary Mr. Harker arrived at nine o'clock. If his journal be true, he is a man of great nerve. That going down to the vault in Dracula's castle a second time was a remarkable piece of daring. Strange that it never struck me that the very next house might be the Count's hiding place. Goodness knows we had enough clues from the conduct of Renfield. Harker thinks Renfield hitherto has been a sort of index to the coming and going of the Count. I am darkly suspicious. All those outbreaks were in some way linked with the proximity of the Count. He is himself zoophagous. 
and in Renfield's wild ravings outside the chapel door of the deserted house he always spoke of master. This all seems confirmation of our idea. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 29th September It was now my object to trace that horrid cargo of the Count's to its place in London. I went to Carter Patterson's central office. They looked up the transaction in their daybook and at once telephoned to their King's Cross office for more details. Of one thing I am now satisfied, that all the boxes which arrived at Whitby from Varna in the Demeter were safely deposited in the old chapel of Carfax. There should be fifty of them there, unless any have since been removed, as from Dr. Seward's diary I fear. I shall try to see the carter who took away the boxes from Carfax when Renfield attacked them. Mina Harker's Journal, 30th of September Arthur and Mr. Quincy Morris arrived earlier than we expected. Dr. Seward was out on business and had taken Jonathan with him, so I had to see them. I told them, as well as I could, that I had read all the papers and diaries and that my husband and I, having typewritten them, had just finished putting them in order. I have given them each a copy to read in the library. Dr. Seward's Diary, 30th of September I got home at five o'clock and found that Arthur and Quincy Morris had arrived. Jonathan Harker had not yet returned from his visit to the carrier's men. Mina, Mrs. Harker, gave us a cup of tea, and when we had finished, she said, I want to see your patient, Mr. Renfield. Do let me see him. She looked so appealing and so pretty that I could not refuse her, so I took her with me. Good evening, Mr. Renfield, said she. You see, I know you, for Dr. Seward has told me of you. You're not the girl the doctor wanted to marry, are you? You can't be, you know, for she's dead. Mrs. Harker smiled sweetly as she replied, Oh, no, I have a husband of my own. I joined in. How did you know I wanted to marry anyone? His reply was simply contemptuous. What an asinine question. You will, of course, understand, Mrs. Harker, that when a man is loved and honoured as our host is, everything regarding him is of interest in our little community. Dr. Seward is loved not only by his household and his friends, but even by his patients, who, being some of them hardly in mental equilibrium, are apt to distort causes and effects. Here was my own pet lunatic talking with the manner of a polished gentleman. I myself am an instance of a man who had a strange belief. I used to fancy that by consuming a multitude of live things, one might indefinitely prolong life. The doctor here will bear me out that on one occasion I tried to kill him for the purpose of strengthening my vital powers, relying, of course, upon the scriptural phrase, for the blood is the life. Looking at my watch, I saw that I should go to the station to meet Van Helsing, so I told Mrs. Harker that it was time to leave. To my astonishment, Renfield said, Goodbye, my dear. I pray God I may never see your sweet face again. I went to the station to meet Van Helsing, and as I drove to the house I told him what we had found, that the house which Dracula had bought was the very next one to my own. Oh, that we had known it before, he said for then we might have reached him in time to save poor Lucy. Mina Harker's Journal, 30th of September We met in Dr. Seward's study two hours after dinner. The professor said, It were, I think, good that I tell you something of the kind of enemy with which we have to deal. There are such beings as vampires. Some of us have evidence that they exist. This vampire which is amongst us is of himself so strong in person as twenty men. He is of cunning more than mortal. He can appear at will, then and where, and in any of the forms that are to him. He can direct the elements, the storm, the fog, the thunder. He can command the rat and the owl and the bat, the moth and the fox and the wolf. He can grow and become small. He can at times vanish and come unknown. My friends, it is a terrible task that we undertake, for if we fail in this our fight, he must surely win. My husband looked in my eyes, and I in his. There was no need for speaking between us. I answer for Mina and myself, he said. Count me in, Professor, 
said Quincy Morris laconically. I am with you, said Arthur, for Lucy's sake. Dr. Seward simply nodded. The professor stood up, and after laying his golden crucifix on the table, all took hands and our solemn compact was made. Dr. Van Helsing went on. The vampire cannot die by mere passing of the time. He can flourish, then that he can fatten on the blood of the living. He can even grow younger. But he cannot flourish without this diet. He can transform himself to wolf, as we gather from the ship arrival at Whitby. He can be as bat. He can come in mist which he create. He come on moonlight rays as elemental dust, as Jonathan saw those sisters in the castle. He can see in the dark. He can do all these things, yet he is not free. He may not enter anywhere at the first, unless there be someone of the household who bid him to come, though afterwards he can come as he please. His power ceases, as does that of all evil things, at the coming of the day. He can only change himself at noon, or at exact sunrise or sunset. Then there are things which so afflict him that he has no power, as the garlic that we know of, and as for things sacred, as this symbol, my crucifix. The branch of wild rose on his coffin keep him that he move not from it. A sacred bullet fired into the coffin kill him, so that he be true dead. And as for the stake through him, we know already, or the cut-off head that giveth rest. Thus, when we find the habitation of this man that was, we can confine him to his coffin and destroy him, if we obey what we know. But he is clever. We know that from the castle in Whitby came fifty boxes of earth, all of which were delivered at Carfax. We also know that at least some of these boxes have been removed. We must trace each of these boxes. And when we are ready, we must either capture or kill this monster in his lair. For you, Madam Mina, this night is the end until all be well. You are too precious to us to have such risk. Mr. Morris resumed the discussion. I vote we have a look at this house right now. Time is everything with him, and swift action on our part may save another victim. Dr. Seward's diary, 1st of October, 4 a.m. Just as we were about to leave the house, an urgent message was brought to me from Renfield to know if I would see him at once. We found him in a state of considerable excitement, but far more rational in his speech and manner than I had ever seen him. His request was that I would at once release him from the asylum and send him home. This he backed up with arguments regarding his complete recovery and adduced his own existing sanity. I appeal to your friends, he said. They will, perhaps, not mind sitting in judgment on my case. I desire to go at once, here, now, this very hour, this very moment. I am content to implore in such a case, not on personal grounds, but for the sake of others. I am not at liberty to give you the whole of my reasons, but you may, I assure you, take it from me that they are good ones, sound and unselfish, and springing from the highest sense of duty. He looked at us all keenly. I had a growing conviction that this sudden change of his entire intellectual method was but yet another form or phase of his madness. Can you not tell frankly your real reason for wishing to be free tonight? He shook his head sadly. Van Helsing said, You claim the privilege of reason in the highest degree, since you seek to impress us with your complete reasonableness. Help us, and if we can, we shall aid you to achieve your wish. He still shook his head. Dr. Van Helsing, I have nothing to say. I am not my own master in the matter. I can only ask you to trust me. I thought it was now time to end the scene, so I went towards the door, simply saying, Come, my friends, we have work to do. Good night. As I got near the door, a new change came over the patient. He threw himself on his knees, tears rolling down his cheeks. Let me entreat you, Dr. Seward. Oh, let me implore you to let me out of this house at once. For the sake of the Almighty, take me out of this and save my soul from guilt. Can't you hear me, man? Can't you understand? I am no lunatic, but a sane man fighting for his soul. Hear me. Let me go. Let me go. Come, I said sternly. No more of this. 
Get to your bed and try to behave more discreetly. When I was leaving the room, he said in a quiet, well-bred voice, You will, I trust, Dr. Seward, do me the justice to bear in mind later on that I did what I could to convince you tonight. Jonathan Harker's Journal, the 1st of October, 5 a.m. We took our way to Carfax. When we got to the porch, the professor opened his bag and took out a lot of things, which he laid on the step. My friends, we are going into a terrible danger, and we need arms of many kinds. Keep this near your heart. He lifted a little silver crucifix and held it out to me. Put these flowers around your neck. He handed me a wreath of withered garlic blossoms. Above all, at the last, this sacred wafer. Each of the others was similarly equipped. Dr. Seward tried one or two skeleton keys. Presently he got one to suit. We pressed on the door, the rusty hinges creaked, and it slowly opened. On a table in the hall was a great bunch of keys, with a time-yellowed label on each. The professor lifted them. You know this place, Jonathan. You have copied maps of it. Which is the way to the chapel? I led the way, and found myself opposite a low, arched oaken door. With a little trouble we found the key on the bunch and opened it. We were prepared for some unpleasantness, but none of us ever expected such an odour as we encountered. It seemed as though corruption had become itself corrupt. We made an accurate examination of the place, the professor saying as we began, the first thing is to see how many of the boxes are left. A glance was sufficient to show how many remained, for the great earth chests were bulky, and there was no mistaking them. There were only twenty-nine left out of the fifty. I saw Quincy Morris step suddenly back from a corner which he was examining. The whole place was becoming alive with rats. For a moment or two we stood appalled, all save Arthur, who was seemingly prepared for such an emergency. Rushing to the great iron-bound door, he turned the key in the lock. Then, taking a little silver whistle from his pocket, he blew a low, shrill call. It was answered from behind Dr. Seward's house by the yelping of dogs, and three terriers came dashing round the corner of the house. They rushed at their natural enemies, who fled before them so fast, that before the dogs had shaken the life out of a score, the whole mass had vanished. The morning was quickening in the east when we emerged from the front. Van Helsing said, Our night has been eminently successful. No harm has come to us, and we have ascertained how many boxes are missing. Mina Harker's Journal, the 1st of October I can't quite remember how I fell asleep. I remember hearing the sudden barking of dogs and a lot of queer sounds from Mr. Renfield's room. I got up and looked out of the window. All was dark and silent. Mist was spreading, and was now close up to the house, so that I could see it lying thick against the wall, as though it were stealing up to the windows. Then I must have fallen asleep, for my dream was very peculiar. It began to dawn on me that the air was heavy and dank and cold. The gaslight came only like a tiny red spark through the fog, which had evidently grown thicker and poured into the room, till it seemed as if it became concentrated into a sort of pillar of cloud, through the top of which I could see the light of the gaslight shining, like a red eye. As I looked, the fire divided, and seemed to shine on me through the fog like two eyes. The last conscious effort which imagination made was to show me a livid, white face bending over me, out of the mist. 2nd of October, 10 p.m. I asked Dr. Seward to give me a sleeping draught. I've taken it, and I'm waiting for sleep. A new fear comes, that I may have been foolish in depriving myself of the power of waking. Jonathan Harker's Journal, the 1st of October. Carter Patterson's head office agreed to give me the names and addresses of the carrier's men, Smollett and Bloxham. Mr. Joseph Smollett remembered all about the incident of the boxes. 
There were, he said, six in the cartload which he left at Mile End, and another six which he deposited at Bermondsey. Bloxham told me that he had made two journeys between Carfax and a house in Piccadilly, and had taken from this house to the latter nine great boxes. I asked him if he could tell me the number of the house. Well, Governor, I forget the number, but it was a dusty old house. I started off for Piccadilly, and at Piccadilly Circus I discharged my cab and walked westward. I came across a house which looked as though it had been long untenanted. The windows were encrusted with dust, and the shutters were up. I asked one or two of the grooms around if they knew anything about the empty house. One of them said, perhaps, Mitchell, Sons and Candy, the house agents, could tell me something. I was soon at their office in Sackville Street. The gentleman who saw me was particularly suave in manner. It is sold, sir. I handed him my card. I act on the part of the Honourable Arthur Holmwood, who wishes to know something of the property which was, he understood, lately for sale. If you will let me have his address, I will communicate with him by tonight's post. I found the others at my home, all gathered round the fire in the study. In the train I had written my diary so far, and simply read it off to them as the best means of letting them get abreast of my own information. Mr. Morris spoke. Say, how are we going to get into that house? We got into the other. But, Arthur, this is different. At Carfax we had night and a walled park to protect us. It'll be a mighty different thing to commit burglary in Piccadilly, either by day or night, unless the agency can find us a key of some sort. Dr. Seward's Diary, the 1st of October. I'm puzzled afresh about Renfield. I asked him, what about the flies these times? He smiled in a superior sort of way. The fly, my dear sir, has one striking feature. Its wings are typical of the aerial powers of the psychic faculties. The ancients did well when they typified the soul as a butterfly. Oh, it is a soul you're after now, is it? I don't want any souls. Indeed, I don't. I couldn't use them if indeed I had them. There would be no manner of use to me. I couldn't eat them or... He suddenly stopped, and the old cunning look spread over his face. Would you like some sugar to get your flies round again? With a laugh, he replied, Not much. Flies are poor things after all. Or spiders, I went on. What's the use of spiders? There isn't anything in them to eat, or... So, so, I thought to myself. This is the second time he has suddenly stopped at the word. Drink. What does it mean? Mitchell, Sons and Candy, to the Honourable Arthur Homewood, the 1st of October. Sir, concerning the sale and purchase of number 347 Piccadilly, the purchaser is a foreign nobleman. Count de Ville. Dr. Seward's diary, 2nd of October. I wonder if Renfield's moods have so followed the doings of the Count that the coming destruction of the monster may be carried to him in some subtle way. He is now seemingly quiet for a spell. Is he? That wild yell seemed to come from his room. Later. When I came to Renfield's room, I found him lying on the floor in a glittering pool of blood. The face was horribly bruised, as though it had been beaten against the floor. The attendant said to me as we turned him over, I think, sir, his back is broken. Both his right arm and leg and the whole side of his face are paralysed. I said to him, Go to Dr. Van Helsing and ask him to come here at once, and fetch Mr. Holmwood and Mr. Morris. Within a very few minutes the professor and the others appeared. We went into a strict examination of the patient. The real injury was a depressed fracture of the skull. The professor said, We must reduce the pressure. We shall wait just long enough to find the best spot for trepanning, so that we may most quickly and perfectly remove the blood clot. At last there came a time when it was evident that the patient was sinking fast. He might die at any moment. The professor spoke. There is no time to lose. His words may be versed many lives. We shall operate just above the ear. Without another word, he made the operation. Renfield moved convulsively and as he did so, said, 
I have had a terrible dream. No, I must not deceive myself. It was no dream, but a grim reality. He came to the window in the mist. Then he began to whisper. Rats, rats, rats. Hundreds, thousands, millions of them, and every one alike and dogs to eat them, and cats too, all lives, all red blood with years of life in it, if you will fall down and worship me. I found myself saying to him, Come in, Lord and Master. When Mrs. Harker came in to see me this afternoon, she didn't look the same. I don't care for the pale people. I like them with lots of blood in them. I began to think, and it made me mad to know that he had been taking the life out of her. Tonight, I was ready for him. He had to come out of the mist to struggle with me. I thought I was going to win till I saw his eyes. They burned into me, and my strength became like water. He raised me up and flung me down. There was a red cloud before me, a noise like thunder, and the mist seemed to steal away under the door. Van Helsing stood up instinctively. We know the verse now, he said. He is here, and we know his purpose. It may not be too late. Outside the Harker's door, Van Helsing turned the handle, but the door did not yield. We threw ourselves against it. With a crash, it burst open. On the bed beside the window lay Jonathan Harker, breathing heavily as though in a stupor. Kneeling on the bed was the white-clad figure of his wife. By her side stood a tall, thin man clad in black. We all recognized the Count. His right hand gripped her by the back of the neck, forcing her face down on his bosom. Her white nightdress was smeared with blood, and a thin stream trickled down the man's bare breast. With a wrench, which threw his victim back upon the bed as though hurled from a height. He turned and sprang at us. But by this time the professor was holding towards him the envelope which contained the sacred wafer. The Count suddenly stopped and cowered back as we, lifting our crucifixes, advanced. The moonlight suddenly failed as a great black cloud sailed across the sky. And when the gaslight sprang up under Quincy's match, we saw nothing but a faint vapour. Van Helsing, Arthur and I moved towards Mrs. Harker. Her face was ghastly, with a pallor which was accentuated by the blood which smeared her lips and cheeks. I heard Harker's quick exclamation as he woke to consciousness. In God's name, what does this mean? Dr. Seward, Dr. Van Helsing, what has happened? Mina, dear, what is it? What does that blood mean? He jumped from the bed and began to pull on his clothes. His wife seized hold of him and cried out, No! No, Jonathan, you must not leave me. You must stay with me. The professor held up his little golden crucifix and said with wonderful calmness, Do not fear, my dear. Whilst this is close to you, no foul thing can approach. You are safe for tonight. Jonathan Harker's Journal, the 3rd of October. When the question began to be discussed as to what should be our next step, Van Helsing was prepared with an exact order of our work. The day is ours, and in it rests our hope. The sun that rose on our sorrow this morning guards us in its course. Until it sets tonight, that monster must retain whatever form he now has. And so we have this day to hunt out all his lairs and sterilize them. In all probable, the key of the situation is in that house in Piccadilly. We shall go there and search that house, and learn what it holds. Run down our old fox! Then let us come at once, I cried. We are wasting precious time. The professor did not move, but simply said, And how are we to get into that house in Piccadilly? Anyway, I cried, we shall break in if need be. And your police, where will they be? Now, suppose that you were the owner of that house and could not get in, what would you do? 
I should get a respectable locksmith and set him to work to pick the lock for me. And your police, they would interfere, would they not? Oh, no. Not if they knew the man was properly employed. Then, he looked at me keenly as he spoke, we shall go after ten o'clock when there are many about, and when such things would be done were we indeed owners of the house. It was agreed that before starting for Piccadilly we should destroy the Count's lair close at hand. After our visit to Carfax we should all enter the house in Piccadilly. The two doctors and I should remain there whilst Arthur and Quincy found the lairs at Bermondsey and Mile End and destroyed them. Van Helsing stood up and said, Madam Mina, you are quite safe here until the sunset, but before we go, let me see you armed against personal attack. On your forehead I touch this piece of sacred wafer in the name of the Father, the Son, and... There was a fearful scream which almost froze our hearts to hear. As he placed the wafer on Mina's forehead, it had burned into the flesh as though it had been a piece of white-hot metal. Pulling her beautiful hair over her face, she wailed, Unclean! Unclean! I must bear this mark of shame upon my forehead until the judgment day. In an agony of helpless grief, I held her tight. Van Helsing turned and said gravely, It may be that you have to bear that mark until God himself see fit on the judgment day. And, oh, my dear, may we who love you be there to see when that red scar shall pass away and leave your forehead as pure as the words we know. There was hope in his heart and comfort. Mina and I each took one of the old man's hands and kissed it. It was then time to start. So I said farewell to Mina, and we set out. We entered Carfax without trouble, and found all things the same as on the first occasion. We found no papers nor any sign of use in the house, and in the old chapel the great boxes looked just as we had seen them last. Van Helsing took from his bag a screwdriver and a wrench, and very soon the top of one of the cases was thrown open. Taking from his box a piece of the sacred wafer, he laid it reverently on the earth, and then shutting down the lid began to screw it home. One by one we treated in the same way each of the great boxes, and left them as we had found them to all appearance. But in each was a portion of the host. Piccadilly, 12.30 o'clock. The minutes seemed to pass with leaden feet as we waited. At length we saw a four-wheeler drive up. Out of it, in leisurely fashion, got Arthur and Morris, and down from the box descended a thick-set working man with his rush-woven basket of tools. The man lifted a good-sized bunch of keys. Selecting one of them, he began to probe the lock, as if feeling his way with it. After fumbling about for a bit, he tried a second, and then a third. All at once the door opened under a slight push from him, and he and the two others entered the hall. We three crossed the street and knocked at the door. It was immediately opened by Quincy Morris. In the dining room, which lay at the back of the hall, we found eight boxes of earth. Eight boxes only out of the nine which we sought. With the tools which we had brought with us, we opened them one by one, and treated them as we had treated those others in the chapel. The dining room contained effects which might belong to the Count, and so we proceeded to minutely examine them. There were title deeds of the Piccadilly House in a great bundle deeds of the purchase of the houses at Mile End and Bermondsey. Last of all was a little heap of keys of all sorts and sizes, belonging to the other houses. Arthur and Quincy Morris, taking accurate notes of the various addresses, took the keys and set out to destroy the boxes in these places. Dr. Seward's Diary, the 3rd of October The time seemed terribly long whilst we were waiting for the coming of Arthur and Quincy Morris. We were startled by a knock at the hall door, the double postman's knock of the telegraph boy. The boy handed in a dispatch. The professor closed the door again, and after looking at the direction, opened it and read it aloud. Look out for D. He has just now, 12.45, come from Carfax hurriedly and hastened towards the south. Mina. There was a pause, broken by Jonathan Harker's voice. Now, God be thanked, we shall soon meet. 
About half an hour after we had received Mrs. Harker's telegram, there came a quiet, resolute knock at the hall door. The gladness of our hearts must have shone upon our faces when we saw Arthur and Quincy Morris. They came quickly in and closed the door behind them. It's all right. We found both places, six boxes in each, and we destroyed them all. He will be here before long now, said Van Helsing. Have all your arms. Be ready. He held up a warning hand as he spoke, for we could all hear a key softly inserted in the lock of the hall door. We waited in a suspense that made the seconds pass with nightmare slowness. The slow, careful steps came along the hall. The Count was evidently prepared for some surprise. At least he feared it. Suddenly, with a single bound, he leapt into the room, winning away past us before any of us could raise a hand to stay him. There was something so panther-like in the movement, something so unhuman, that it seemed to sober us all from the shock of his coming. The first to act was Harker, who had ready his great kukri knife, and made a fierce and sudden cut at him. Only the diabolical quickness of the Count's leap back saved him. As it was, the point just cut the cloth of his coat, whence a bundle of banknotes and a stream of gold fell out. The expression of the Count's face was so hellish that for a moment I feared for Harker. Instinctively I moved forward, holding the crucifix and wafer in my hand. I felt a mighty power fly along my arm, and it was without surprise that I saw the monster cower back. His waxen hue became greenish-yellow by the contrast of his burning eyes, and the red scar on the forehead showed on the pallid skin like a palpitating wound. The next instant, with a sinuous dive, grasping a handful of money from the floor, he dashed across the room and threw himself at the window. Amid the crash and glitter of the falling glass, he tumbled into the flagged area below. We saw him spring unhurt from the ground and open the stable door. Then he turned and spoke to us. You shall be sorry yet, each one of you. You think you have left me without a place to rest. But I have more. My revenge is just begun. I spread it over centuries, and time is on my side. With a contemptuous sneer he passed quickly through the door, and we heard the rusty bolt creak as he fastened it behind him. The first of us to speak was the professor. We need not despair. There is but one more earth box, and we must try to find it. When that is done, all may yet be well. We had a sort of perfunctory supper together, and I think it cheered us all up somewhat. True to our promise, we told Mrs. Harker everything which had passed. And, although she grew white at times when danger had seemed to threaten her husband, she listened bravely and with calmness. Before they retired, the professor fixed up the room against any coming of the vampire, and assured Mrs. Harker that she might rest in peace. Quincy, Arthur, and I arranged that we should sit up, dividing the night between us, and watch over the safety of the poor stricken lady. Jonathan Harker's Journal, the 4th of October, morning. During the night, I was wakened by Mina. She said to me hurriedly, Go, call the professor. I want to see him at once. Why? I asked. I have an idea. Two or three minutes later, Van Helsing was in the room in his dressing gown, and Mr. Morris and Arthur were with Dr. Seward at the door. I want you to hypnotize me, she said. Do it before the dawn, for I feel that then I can speak, and speak freely. Looking fixedly at her, he commenced to make passes in front of her, from over the top of her head downward, with each hand in turn. Gradually her eyes closed, and she sat stock still. Where are you now? The answer came dreamily, but with intention. I do not know. It is all strange to me. What do you see? I can see nothing. It is all dark. What do you hear? The lapping of water. Little waves leap. I can hear them on the outside. Then you are on a ship? Oh, yes. What else do you hear? 
the sound of men stamping overhead as they run about. There is the creaking of a chain. The voice faded away into a deep breath, as of one sleeping. That ship, wherever it was, was weighing anchor whilst she spoke. There are many ships weighing anchor at the moment in your so great port of London. He hath take his last earth box on board a ship, and he leave the land. He think to escape, but no, we follow him. Nina Harker's Journal, the 5th of October, 5 p.m. Dr. Van Helsing described what steps were taken during the day to discover on what boat and whither bound Count Dracula made his escape. He was in sailing ship, since Madame Mina tells of sails being set. We go to your Lloyd's, where are notes of all ships that sail, however so small. There we find that only one Black Sea-bound ship go out with the tide. She is the Sarina Catherine and she will sail from Doolittle's Wharf for Varna. Said I, this is the ship whereon is the Count. So off we go to Doolittle's Wharf. They make known to us among them how last afternoon at about five o'clock comes a man so hurry, a tall man, thin and pale, with high nose and teeth so white, and eyes that seem to be burning. The captain come, when told that he will be pay well, and though he swear much at the first, he agree to turn. Then the tin man go, and soon he come again, himself driving cart on which is a great box. This he himself lift down, though it takes several to put it on truck for the ship. It soon became apparent to all that the Sarina Catherine would not sail as expected. A thin mist began to creep up from the river, and it grew and grew, till soon a dense fog. Just at full tide, the tin man came up the gangplank again, and asked to see where his box had been stowed. He went down with the mate and saw where it was placed, then came up and stood a while on deck in fog. He must have come off by himself, for none noticed him. Indeed, they thought not of him, for soon the fog began to melt away, and all was clear again. And so our enemy is at sea, with the fog at his command, on his way to the Danube mouth. To sail a ship takes time, go she never so quick, and when we start we go on land more quick, and we meet him there. Dr. Seward's Diary, the 5th of October When the professor came into my study, we talked over the state of things. I could see that he had something on his mind. Friend John, there's something that you and I must talk of alone. Our poor dear Madame Mina is changing. I see the characteristics of the vampire coming in her face. It is now but very, very slight, but it is to be seen. Her teeth are some sharper, and at times her eyes are more hard. My fear is this. If it be that she can, by our hypnotic trance, tell what the Count see and hear, is it not more true that he who have hypnotized her first, and who have drink of her very blood, should, if he will, compel her mind to disclose to him that which she know. We must keep her ignorant of our intent, and so she cannot tell what she know not. Later. At the very outset of our meeting, a great personal relief was experienced by both Van Helsing and myself. Mrs. Harker had sent a message to say that she would not join us at present, as she thought it better that we should be free to discuss our movements without her presence to embarrass us. We went at once into our plan of campaign. Van Helsing put the facts before us first. The Tsarina Catherine left the Thames yesterday morning. It will take her at the quickest speed she has ever made at least three weeks to reach Varna, but we can travel overland to the same place in three days. Quincy Morris added, I understand that the Count comes from a wolf country, and it may be that he will get there before us. I propose that we add Winchester rifles to our armament. I have a kind of belief in a Winchester when there is any trouble of that sort around. Good, said Van Helsing. Winchesters it shall be. 
Tonight and tomorrow we can get ready, and then, if all be well, we four can set out on our journey. We four, said Harker, looking from one to another of us. Of course, answered the professor quickly. You must remain to take care of your so sweet wife. Jonathan Harker's Journal, the 6th of October, morning. Mina woke me early about the same time as yesterday, and asked me to bring Dr. Van Helsing. He came at once. He asked Mina if the others might come too. No, it will not be necessary. You can tell them just as well. I must go with you on your journey. But why? You must take me with you. I am safer with you, and you shall be safer too. I can tell you now, whilst the sun is coming up, I may not be able again. I know that when the Count wills me, I must go. I know if he tells me to come in secret, I must come. You men are brave and strong. You are strong in your numbers, for you can defy that which would break down the human endurance of one who had to guard alone. Besides, I may be of service since you can hypnotize me and so learn that which even I myself do not know. Dr. Van Helsing said very gravely, Madam Mina, you are, as always, most wise. You shall with us come, and together we shall do that which we go forth to achieve. Dr. Seward's Diary, the 11th of October, evening. I think that none of us were surprised when we were asked to see Mrs. Harker a little before the time of sunset. Motioning her husband to sit beside her on the sofa, she made the rest of us bring chairs up close. Taking her husband's hand in hers, she began. You are going to be so good to me as to take me with you. But you must remember that I am not as you are. There is a poison in my blood, in my soul, which may destroy me, which must destroy me, unless some relief comes to us. Oh, my friends, you must promise me, one and all, even you, my beloved husband, that should the time come, you will kill me. What is that time? The voice was Quincy's. When you shall be convinced that I am so changed, that it is better that I die, then you will, without a moment's delay, drive a stake through me and cut off my head, or do whatever else may be wanting to give me rest. Quincy knelt down before her, and taking her hand in his, said solemnly, I swear to you by all that I hold sacred and dear, that should the time ever come, I shall not flinch from the duty that you have set us. I swear the same, my dear Madam Mina, said Van Helsing. And I, said Arthur, each of them in turn kneeling to her. I followed myself. Then her husband turned to her. And must I, too, make such a promise? You, too? My dearest, she said. Jonathan Harker's Journal, the 15th of October, Varna. We left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th, got to Paris the same night, and took the places secured for us in the Orient Express. We travelled night and day, arriving here at about five o'clock. Thank God Mina is well. Throughout the journey she slept nearly all the time. Before sunrise and sunset, however, she is very wakeful and alert, and it has become a habit for Van Helsing to hypnotize her at such times. He always asks her what she can see and hear. She answers to the first, Nothing. All is dark. And to the second, I can hear the waves lapping against the ship, and the water rushing by. It is evident that the Tsarina Catherine is still at sea. 24th of October. Ten days of waiting. Mina's hypnotic answer is unvaried. Lapping waves, rushing water, and creaking masts. Telegram, October the 24th. Rufus Smith, Lloyd's London, to Arthur Holmwood, care of British Vice Consul, Varna. Tsarina Catherine reported this morning from Dardanelles. Dr. Seward's diary the 24th of October. It is only about twenty-four hours' sail from the Dardanelles to here, at the rate the Tsarina Catherine has come from London. She should, therefore, arrive some time in the morning. 
We are all in a fever of excitement, except Harker, who is calm. His hands are as cold as ice, and an hour ago I found him wetting the edge of the great Gurkha knife which he now always carries with him. 27th October, noon. Most strange. No news yet of the ship we wait for. Mrs. Harker reported this morning as usual. Lapping waves and rushing water. Though she added that the waves were very faint. 28th of October. Telegram, Rufus Smith, Lloyds of London, to Arthur Holmwood. Tsarina Catherine reported entering Galatz at one o'clock today. Dr. Seward's Diary, the 28th of October. When does the train start for Galatz? said Dr. Van Helsing to us generally. At 6.30 tomorrow morning. We all stared, for the answer came from Mrs. Harker. How on earth do you know? said Arthur. You forget, or perhaps you do not know, that I am a train fiend. At home in Exeter I always used to make up the timetables so as to be helpful to my husband. I knew that if anything were to take us to Castle Dracula, we should go by Galatz, so I learned the times very carefully. Wonderful woman, murmured the professor. Now, let us organize. You, friend Arthur, go to the train and get the tickets, and arrange that all be ready for us to go in the morning. Dr. Seward's Diary, 29th of October When the usual time came round, Mrs. Harker, after a longer and more strenuous effort than has been usually necessary, sank into the trance. I can see nothing. We are still. There are no waves lapping, but only a steady swirl of water softly running. I can hear men's voices calling, near and far, and the roll and creak of oars. There is tramping of feet overhead, and ropes and chains are dragged along. There is a gleam of light. I can feel the air blowing upon me. Van Helsing said, You see, my friends, he is close to land. He has left his earth chest, but he has yet to get on shore. We may then arrive in time, for if he escape not at night, we shall come on him in daytime, boxed up and at our mercy. Jonathan Harker's Journal, the 30th of October, Galatz. At nine o'clock, Dr. Van Helsing, Dr. Seward, and I called on the agents of the London firm of Hapgood. They took us at once on board the Tsarina Catherine, which lay at anchor out in the river harbour. The captain said, In the morning, an hour before sun-up, a man came aboard with an order, written to him from England, to receive a box marked for one Count Dracula. What was the name of the man who took it? asked Dr. Van Helsing. He produced a receipt signed Emanuel Hildesheim. This was all the captain knew, so with thanks we came away. We found Hildesheim in his office. He had received a letter from Mr. Deville of London telling him to receive a box which would arrive in the Tsarina Catherine. This he was to give in charge to a certain Petrov Skinsky. When Skinsky had come to him, he had taken him to the ship and handed over the box. That was all he knew. We then sought for Skinsky, but were unable to find him. One of his neighbours said that he had gone away two days before, no one knew whither. Whilst we were talking, one came running, and breathlessly gasped out that the body of Skinsky had been found inside the wall of the churchyard of St. Peter, and that the throat had been torn open as if by some wild animal. <laughs> A Memorandum by Mina Harker 30th of October, evening Count Dracula's problem is to get back to his own place. My surmise is this, that in London the Count decided to get back to his castle by water as the most safe and secret way. When the box was on land, he came out, met Skinsky, and instructed him what to do as to arranging the carriage of the box upriver. When this was done, he blotted out his traces, as he thought, by murdering his agent. When I had done reading, Dr. Van Helsing said, Our dear Madam Mina is once more our teacher, 
Her eyes have seen where we were blinded. We are on the track once again. I shall get a steam launch and follow him, said Arthur. And I horses to follow on the bank, lest by chance he land, said Mr. Morris. I'll take Madame Mina right into the heart of the enemy's country. Whilst the old fox is tied in his box, floating on the running stream, whence he cannot escape to land, we shall find our way to the castle of Dracula. Jonathan interrupted him hotly. Do you mean to say, Professor Van Helsing, that you would bring Mina, in her sad case and tainted as she is with that devil's illness, right into the jaws of his death trap? My friend, it is because I would save Madame Mina from that awful place that I would go. If the Count escape us this time, and he is strong and subtle and cunning, he may choose to sleep him for a century, and then in time... Our dear one, he took my hand, would come to him and keep him company. Do as you will, said Jonathan, with a sob that shook him all over. We are in the hands of God. Later. Professor Van Helsing and I are to leave for the 11.40 train tonight for Veresti, where we are to get a carriage to drive to the Borgo Pass. We have all got arms, even for me a large bore revolver. Jonathan would not be happy unless I was armed like the rest. Jonathan Harker's Journal, October the 30th, night. I am writing this in the light from the furnace door of the steam launch. Mr. Morris and Dr. Seward were off on their long ride before we started. They have two spare horses, four in all. It may be necessary for us to join forces. If so, they can mount our whole party. Here, as we are rushing along through the darkness, with the cold from the river seeming to rise up and strike us, we seem to be drifting into a whole world of dark and dreadful things. Mina Harker's Journal, the 31st of October Arrived at Veresti at noon. The professor tells me that this morning at dawn he could hardly hypnotize me at all, and that all I could say was, Dark and quiet. Dr. Van Helsing has got the carriage and horses. We are to have some dinner and start in an hour. Memorandum by Abraham Van Helsing, the 4th of November. We got to the Borgo Pass just after sunrise. Madame Mina look in her sleep more healthy and more redder than before. I like it not. The 5th of November. All yesterday we travel ever getting closer to the mountains and moving into a more and more wild and desert land. Then, ere the great dark came upon us, I make a fire, and near it I made Madame Mina sit comfortable amid her rugs. Then, with the fear on me of what might be, I drew a ring so big for her comfort, around where Madame Mina sat, and over the ring I passed some of the wafer, and I broke it fine, so that all was well guarded. She sat still all the time, so still as one dead, and she grew whiter and ever whiter, till snow was not more pale, and no word she said. Presently I began to fear, horrible fears. It was as though my memories of all Jonathan's horrid experience were fooling me, for the snowflakes and the mist began to wheel and circle round till I could get as though a shadowy glimpse of those women that would have kissed him. The wheeling figures of mist and snow came closer, but keeping ever without the holy circle. Then they began to materialize, till there were before me in actual flesh the same three women that Jonathan saw, when they would have kissed his throat. They smiled ever at poor dear Madame Mina, and as their laugh came through the silence of the night, they twined their arms and pointed to her and said, Come, sister, come to us, come, come. I seized some of the firewood which was by me, and holding out some of the wafer, advanced on them. They could not approach me whilst so armed, nor Madame Mina whilst she remained within the ring. And so we remained, till the red of the dawn began to fall through the snow gloom. 
The horrid figures melted in the whirling mist and snow. The wreaths of transparent gloom moved away towards the castle and were lost. 5th of November, afternoon. When I left Madame Mina sleeping within the holy circle, I took my way to the castle. I found the old chapel, for I knew that here my work lay. I knew that there were at least three graves to find, graves that are in habit. So I search, and search, and I find one of them. She lay in her vampire sleep, so full of life and voluptuous beauty, that I shudder as though I have come to do murder. Then I found, by wrenching away tomb-tops, one other of the sisters, the other dark one. I go on searching until presently I find in a high, great tomb the other fair sister, so radiantly beautiful, so exquisitely voluptuous, that the very instinct of man in me made my head whirl with emotion. But, God be thanked, I had nerved myself to my wild work. There was one great tomb more lordly than all the rest, huge and nobly proportioned. On it was but one word, Dracula. Before I began to restore these women to their dead selves, I laid in Dracula's tomb some of the wafer, and so banished him from it, undead for ever. Then began my terrible task, and I dreaded it. It was butcher work. Had I not been nerved by thoughts of other dead and of the living over whom hung such a pall of fear, I could not have gone on. I could not have endured the horrid screeching as the stake drove home, the plunging of writhing form and lips of bloody foam. Hardly had my knife severed the head of each before the whole body began to melt away, and crumble into its native dust, as though the death that should have come centuries ago had at last assert himself. Mina Harker's Journal, the 6th of November It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. We could hear the distant howling of wolves, they were far off, but the sound, even through the deadening snowfall, was full of terror. In a little while the professor signalled to me. He had found a natural hollow rock with an entrance like a doorway between two boulders. Here you will be in shelter, and if the wolves do come, I can meet them one by one. Look, Madame Mina, look, look. Straight in front of us and not far off came a group of mounted men hurrying along, in the midst of them was a cart. On the cart was a great square chest. My heart leapt as I saw it. I turned to the professor. See, he said, they are flogging the horses and galloping as hard as they can. They are racing for the sunset. We may be too late. Then, look, look, two horsemen follow fast, coming up from the south. It must be Quincy and John. At the same time I saw on the north side of the coming party two other men riding at breakneck speed. One of them I knew was Jonathan. The professor shouted in glee. They are all converging. When the time comes, we shall have the gypsies on all sides. I got out my revolver, for whilst we were speaking the howling of the wolves came louder and closer. All at once two voices shouted out to halt. One was my Jonathan's, raised in a high key of passion. The other, Mr. Morris's strong, resolute tone of quiet command. The gypsies may not have known the language, but there was no mistaking the tone. They lashed the horses which sprang forward, but the four men raised their Winchester rifles and in an unmistakable way commanded them to stop. At the same moment, Dr. Van Helsing and I rose behind the rock and pointed our weapons at them. Seeing that they were surrounded, the men tightened their reins and drew up. Every man of the gypsy party drew what weapon he carried, knife or pistol, and held himself in readiness to attack. I could see Jonathan on one side of the ring of men, and Quincy on the other, forcing a way to the cart. 
Jonathan's singleness of purpose seemed to overawe those in front of him. Instinctively they cowered aside and let him pass. In an instant he had jumped upon the cart. In the meantime Mr. Morris had had to use force to pass through his side of the ring. I had seen him pressing desperately forward, seen the knives of the gypsies flash as they cut at him. He parried with his great bowie knife, but with his left hand he was clutching at his side, and blood was spurting through his fingers. Under the efforts of both men, the lid of the chest began to yield, the nails drew with a quick screeching sound, and the top of the box was thrown back. The gypsies, seeing themselves covered by the Winchesters, made no further resistance. I saw the Count lying within the box upon the earth. He was deathly pale, just like a waxen image, and the red eyes glared with the horrible, vindictive look which I knew too well. As I looked, the eyes saw the sinking sun, and the look of hate in them turned to triumph. But on the instant came the sweep and flash of Jonathan's great knife. I shrieked as I saw it sheer through the throat, whilst at the same moment Mr. Morris's bowie knife plunged in the heart. Before our very eyes, and almost in the drawing of a breath, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. The gypsies turned without a word and rode away as if for their lives. The wolves, which had withdrawn to a safe distance, followed in their wake. Mr. Morris had sunk to the ground. Blood still gushed through his fingers. With a sigh, he took my hand. He must have seen the anguish of my heart in my face, for he smiled at me and said, Oh, God, it was worth this to die. Look, look. God be thanked that all has not been in vain. See, the snow is not more stainless than her forehead. The curse has passed away. <laughs>